so this happened last year, and it's still really on my mind. Here it goes. So, one night I had my friend Katie over at my house, and we wanted to go and walk to McDonald's by ourselves. We wanted to spend some time together, and McDonald's wasn't that far away from my house. My mom said we could go, and soon after, we'd started our journey and began walking outside in the dark, heading to the McDonald's. Because I was with Katie, I wasn't really creeped out or anything. Well, we eventually made it to the McDonald's, so we headed inside and ordered. When we got inside, we saw that there was a middle-aged man behind us. Now, it didn't really make us feel uncomfortable. That is, until Katie looked at him for a second, and she pulled me aside, saying that the old man was staring at her asses. I honestly thought she was joking, but she was acting really serious, and she wanted to leave immediately. So for her sake, I decided we would. We left with our food, of course, and to my absolute shock, the man followed us. I was beginning to get really creeped out at this point, and so was Katie. We started speed walking, and the man was as well, telling us hard now. We went from being creeped out and concerned to now completely terrified. It was complete silence until the man then said, For young girls, y'all have really nice asses. I wonder what your panty sizes are. I really wish I could give y'all a wedgie. <laughs> so at that point, survival mode kicked in for the both of us. We started running as fast as we could, not once looking back. We heard footsteps running behind us too. When me and my friend finally saw the house, we both ran like a bat out of hell, all the way until we were finally on the front porch. And thank God that my mom left the door unlocked for us to get inside. Because when we opened the door and looked back, the man was still running after us. And as we looked a little closer, we then saw a knife in his hand. We immediately closed the door. My mom, with a look of confusion on her face, asked what was going on. We told her to look out the window, and she did, and we did too, and to my absolute shock, the man was still outside my house and screaming obscenities at us, still talking about our asses and asking about our panty sizes. He did eventually walk off after that, with the knife still in his hand. My mom was going to call the police, but there's no point once the man left us alone. We told my mom what happened after we went to the McDonald's and how it all led to this crazy ass man following us. We were horrified, but we were really glad that we finally made it home safe and sound. A lot of people might think this story is too mild to even be considered scary, but for me and Katie, this is one of the creepiest experiences to have ever happened to us. I really hope that man didn't pull this on any other young girls, but in reality, he probably did. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. This happened nearly five years ago. It was a Friday night in the UK, and a week before my 20th birthday. Also, it was technically a Saturday, because it was a little after 12 a.m. I get paid on a Saturday, and my usual routine was to walk the 10 to 15 minutes to McDonald's to get something to eat. So I walk up, go to order my food, and it declined. I freak out, thinking maybe I haven't been paid, but I had then realized I had grabbed an old card instead of my new one. I went in a huff, basically, and made the long trek home. By the time I had gotten back and procrastinated for another half an hour, it was about 2.30 a.m. I was determined, however, to get food. I again started the walk back to the McDonald's. Now, there's a huge field behind my flat, mostly used for football or dog walking. It was my shortcut that really took the 10 minutes off of my journey. So I'm walking across the field, listening to music in my headphones, 
and then bang. Out of nowhere, I had fell to the floor in a complete daze, ears just ringing, and I couldn't really make out what was happening. As my vision came into focus, I saw this tall skinny dude standing over me. What must have happened was he must have either punched or kicked me right in the back of my head. I have no idea why and I would never seen him before. He wouldn't say anything and I was just repeating, what have I done? I don't know you, over and over again. Then he said, take off your pants. And that was it. Survival mode kicked in and this time I chose both. I had somehow managed to get up to run but I felt something snap in my leg. I fell back down and he proceeded to try and strangle me. I scratched his face and I actually got up. I didn't care about my leg. I was five minutes away from home. I ran and I would seen him run toward me for like two seconds before then giving up. I ran like hell to get home and when I finally made it home, I cried into my mom's arms while following a police report. I also did a lineup but I wasn't able to identify anyone as it was pitch black and I haven't seen him since, but I still have anxiety about where I live, as the police said he might actually live in my area. Be safe out there, but also don't let people scold you for wanting McDonald's at 3 a.m. Just because you're hungry or wanting to walk or whatever, that doesn't justify people blaming you for your assault. You have the right to walk the streets and feel safe, regardless of the time. I'm a male, and I was around 8 or 9 when this happened. Obviously, I don't really remember that much since I was a kid. But anyways, I was recently asked by my mom what I remembered about this day. My mom was taking my sister and I to go see a movie. We decided to stop at a McDonald's to kill some time. There was a strange guy wearing a purple suit who had followed us in and sat at a nearby table without ordering anything. After we finished eating, I got up to clean my retainer in the bathroom sink. The man had followed me into the bathroom and then stood between me and the door. He asked if I wanted a juice box. I told him no, but he told me I needed to go out to his car with him so I could pick out a flavor. My parents had always drilled into my head to never go with a stranger, so I had immediately knew what was happening. I ran right past him and out the bathroom door into the lobby, and I had then told my mom what had happened. He followed me out and he had started coming towards us. My mom then stood up and started making a really big scene in the McDonald's. She loudly asked him why I was trying to get her son to go out to his car with him. He said that he was just trying to give me a juice box, and he then hurriedly left, then got into his car and drove off. Luckily, there was a police car in the parking lot, so we waved down the cop and we told him what happened. Unfortunately, the man in the purple suit was gone by this point. I had forgotten most of what happened before and after the incident, but I still vividly remember the terror I felt being alone in the bathroom with him blocking the door. It was only 10 to 20 seconds, but I'll never forget that uneasy feeling. I'm really grateful that my mom was such a rock star and knew to make a scene to scare him off. No idea what would have happened if I had gone out there with him. Be safe out there. This happened to me when I was 19 at my local McDonald's back in 2009. I've done tons of under the table stuff like a bouncer, a babysitter, and even a waiter. These were all jobs that were simple enough and I figured working at McDonald's would be no different. I had worked the early morning shifts with one of my coworkers named Emma. Sometimes we'd have to get there at really early hours of the morning to get everything set up. One morning, I arrived to work a bit earlier than usual as I was the one with the keys and wanted to get a head start. As I'm getting out of my car, I notice a woman in a raincoat standing by the front door holding a bag. She immediately asks if we were open and I politely tell her no and that she'd have to come back later. She gives me this upset frown and walks away in anger, just like a child would when they can't have a toy. It was weird, but there were a lot of weird people in the area at the time, so it wasn't uncommon. I go inside and Emma comes in shortly after to help refill sauces and napkins so that we could get ready to open. 
It's around 3.15 a.m. and Emma and I are wiping down tables when I see the woman from before looking inside with this menacing grin. I was shocked to see her and so was Emma. Abby, who is that? She asked. I tell her that I didn't know and that she was probably just waiting until we opened. We finish wiping down the tables and we're ready to open but our policy states that we couldn't open until the given time, which is 4am in Canada. With basically nothing left to do at this point, we go to the back and play some games on our phones when I hear a loud crash. I see that the front glass door is now shattered and the woman from before is stepping inside with a hammer. I tell Emma to hide while I grab the bat we kept under the counter yelling at her to leave. She refuses to comply and she comes charging at me with the hammer. Expectedly, she misses me while falling to the floor giving me and Emma time to get out. We are outside on the phone with the police and the woman is still inside damaging things while screaming. The nearest police station was only a few blocks away, so they were able to come within a matter of minutes. Now this is where the story takes an unexpected turn. We see a police cruiser pull up to the McDonald's and two police officers step out. One of them being male and the other one female. They go inside and they're instantly met with the deranged woman face to face. By now they're ordering her to drop the hammer and she's screaming louder than I heard before. The woman charged at the female officer with full force and knocked her out cold. The male officer then tases the woman and she suddenly stops screaming. After a while, there were several police units on standby and an ambulance for the badly injured officer. Turns out, this woman is a violent schizophrenic and hasn't been taking her meds. She's been in and out of jail several times for assault and battery as well as theft. She's extremely messed up in the head and was taken to a mental institution to get the help she needed. The McDonald's remained closed for about a week after that with my manager allowing us to get paid during that time. This is by far my scariest incident that's ever taken place during my time working at McDonald's. I've had other experiences, but this one takes the prize. I had just turned 16 years old a week prior and it was my fifth month working at this restaurant, and I was doing really good. I had just gotten a raise, I was friends with my coworkers, and I was thoroughly enjoying my job. I eventually got put on a closing shift, since now I was old enough. I was working with my friend Jason, as we always had a good time at work. I was working the drive through and he was at the front counter. We had our usual dinner rush, and after that, we had a few customers that would pop in and out. I was walking over to the Frosty machine to fill up someone's Frosty when I had saw Jason talking to a customer. Now, a little background. Jason had a drive through headset on. This was because when things got less busy, the sandwich maker also does the front counter until we close the lobby. So, Jason had this younger adult male customer. I had noticed that his arms looked like they had needle pricks, as this wasn't uncommon in this area. I told myself that I'd keep an eye on the situation to make sure that the man didn't try to hustle any money out of us. But apparently, he also saw me too. I had finished the Frosty and handed it to the customer when I heard Jason over the headset. Hey, this dude won't stop making comments about you. I then looked over at him once the customer in the drive through had left and I cocked my eyebrow at him. He said into the headset, he's saying some really weird things about you and your body. I don't know. It's enough to even make me uncomfortable. I was getting ready to respond to the headset when this man pokes his head above the frosty machine and then says, How old are you? I'm 16. Well, I'm 28. 
My name's Ben. I said hi, and I got back to doing my job. The man kept trying to talk to me, though, even when I was on the intercom with customers. He didn't like the fact that I was ignoring him, and he started to yell really awful things to me. Jason got pissed at this, and he told the guy to leave as I sprinted back to the office to go tell my manager what was happening. My manager looked horrified, as he had just turned 18 not too long ago and was just recently made a manager. He walked to the front counter, and he told the guy to leave or he was going to call the cops. The man angrily stormed out of the store, but not before he spit on Jason and flipped us all off as he left. My manager asked if we wanted to call the cops, as spitting on someone is assault. But Jason just said that he wanted to finish his shift with no incident, and I agreed. The rest of the night went pretty smooth. Eventually, the store was closed, and we had finished up cleaning. At this point, it was 1 a.m. My manager told me I could go, so I grabbed my stuff, said goodbye to them both, and started to walk out to my car. Now, I didn't ask anyone to walk with me because one, I didn't want to be a bother. Two, my car was right next to the building. And three, my car was in a really well-lit area next to a Taco Bell, whose drive through line was packed. I exited through the back exit, and I started to walk across the parking lot. Although, as I had walked, I started to get that feeling that I was being watched. I thought that I was just being paranoid, but I still found myself looking at the entrance of the dumpster parking lot. Then I saw the door swing open, and those doors are extremely heavy. Standing there in the entrance of the parking lot was the guy. As I started to book it to my car, I ripped my keys from my bag, dropping my bag in the process, and started to vigorously unlock my car with the button. I heard slamming footsteps behind me. He was charging at me. I just remember my only thought being, I'm actually going to die in a fast food chain parking lot. I slammed into my car as my body wasn't letting me slow down. I swung the door open, jumped in, shutting and locking the door behind me. I looked out the window and saw this man on the ground. He had tripped over my bag that I dropped. Relief rushed over me, but quickly left again and closed the distance between him and my car. He started tapping on my window and pulling the handle to my door. I started to look for my phone when I realized I left it in my bag. I didn't know what to do. His taps were slowly turning into bangs, and I thought he was going to break my window. I could see the anger in his face and a clouded glaze over his eyes. He had blood running down his arm from something. He had stopped banging for a second and stared me in the eyes. I must have looked like a deer in the headlights. I was petrified. That's when he started to bang his entire head on the door. With each bang, it had rattled by the entire car. He was now starting to leave bloody headprints on my window. He had cut his own forehead open from how hard he was banging it. That's when my first good idea of this whole situation came up. I started to blare my horn. This caught him off guard. He had stopped banging and he looked at the back door of the store. I saw his eyes widen as he booked it off into the empty parking lot and then across the street. I looked down my back window and saw Jason charging in with a salad knife and my manager on the phone with someone. I slowly unlocked my car and opened the door. I went to get up, but my entire body was shaking so badly that I couldn't. Jason told me that our manager was on the phone with the cops and they'd be here soon. I finally felt my body relax. I didn't know that I'd been tensing that hard. Eventually, the police showed up along with my mom. I gave them a statement and I then went home with my mom driving behind me. I didn't go into work for almost two weeks after that. And even then, they just had me in the back making salads for a while, as they didn't want to risk the man coming in again. The police never called us, and they had never found the guy. All I know is that they had found used needles in a crack pipe behind the dumpster. They didn't know if it belonged to him, though. And as previously stated, this happens a lot in this area. I'm just so glad I was able to escape it. These are my stories. I hope you're able to learn from them in some way or another. To all my fast food workers out there, stay safe. And if you're a female worker on a night shift, please have someone walk you out to your car. I can promise you that you're not being overly cautious. Just do it. For some background, 
I'm a 26-year-old female that spent my childhood living between a semi-big city and a college town. I have two older brothers that are eight and six years older than me, and a sister three years younger. Before my parents met in corporate America, my dad was a police officer. This is relevant later. From the time I was born until I was eight, my family still lived in my parents' starter home from the 90s. When they purchased the home a few years before I was born, the neighborhood was blossoming, literally. There used to be most well-maintained yard competitions, full of newly married couples having their first kids and families. My granddad lived a block away. Some of the neighborhood kids were my brother's ages, and other neighbors had kids that I'd grow up through my toddler phase with. Before I get into the story, I need to set the stage for how the neighborhood grew with my siblings and me. As we grew up, my brother's friends grew more and more mischievous. There were gangs that controlled the middle school bathrooms, making other kids pay money or take a beating to go in. We had bomb threats from the time I was in first grade, and they happened so often that I remember instead of getting scared, sitting in a field watching my teacher go into a building and just thinking, I really hope she doesn't get blown up today. The neighborhood school slowly added more and more security measures to the point where the fence around the playground looked like a prison yard. The teenagers would break into empty houses and light grease fires, old Christmas trees, etc. When I was seven years old, my granddad was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He was in in-home hospice care and he had a plethora of medications to manage his pain and comfort. He heard a knock on the door, and thinking it was the cable man, told them to come in. To his surprise, a young man my brother's age walked into his bedroom. The teenager sat at his bedside and had pleasant conversations with him, until he picked up several bottles of my granddad's painkillers and left. The teenager was later found passed out in the driveway, right across from my granddad's house, and was in an overdose-induced coma last I heard, which was nearly two decades ago. Now, the neighborhood McDonald's. Next door, there was a small strip mall with a subway and a wing house, and the McDonald's parking lot had two entrances on opposite sides. Being seven, I requested only a plain cheeseburger and my Happy Meal. This McDonald's had a habit of not following this customization, and since I would refuse to eat it, my parents had to go back through the drive-thru to get another one. On this night, it was already dark, so it was after 8 p.m., and my parents had taken my four-year-old sister and me through the McDonald's drive-thru. Again, I was seven, so I don't really remember the exact time or why we were at McDonald's so late. I got my Happy Meal, and to no one's surprise, my cheeseburger had all the condiments, Ketchup, mustard, onions, everything. All of the enemies of a seven-year-old. My dad was driving our SUV, and as we turned around the building to go back into the empty drive through a sedan came racing into the opposite side of the parking lot to a swerving stop, and the passenger door flew open. With my dad's calm background, he instinctively knew that this was about to turn into a very dangerous situation. He took a sharp turn, and placed our car between the sedan and the opposite exit of the lot, preventing the car from exiting without having to hit the building. Probably not a great move with two young children in the car, but his cop instincts took over, and I digress. Within seconds, we saw red and blue lights from all sides, and heard sirens wailing, and police cars then squealing in. My dad quickly pulled our SUV into a parking spot, Suddenly, the entire McDonald's brick outside and golden arches were totally highlighted red and blue, and officers had guns pointed at the sedan, demanding the driver and passengers to get out. A woman sat in the driver's seat sobbing, and a man jumped out of the passenger seat, gun aimed at the police, using the door as a shield. Another man sat in the back seat, making no movement. Shots were fired on both sides and the man took off running into the only corner of the lot that contained woods as officers sprinted after him. Multiple officers rushed to remove the woman and the other man from the car, 
and they had them in cuffs while my dad stepped out of our car to talk to the remaining officers at the scene. The officers informed my dad that the armed man robbed the subway next door shortly before. The man shot both young female workers, killing one in the store and forcing the other to crawl to the wing house, leaving a trail of blood behind her while she desperately scraped her entire body on the concrete, fighting for her life in any way to get help. She was able to get the hostess to call 911 and eventually recovered in the hospital. I no longer wanted my happy meal as my four-year-old sister and I cried quietly in the car while my mom tried to comfort us with a terrified look on her face. We left the situation with the cops and went to go check on my granddad. For the rest of that night, I honestly thought the man was going to find us and I jumped at any tap in the night. I moved to my college town when I was eight and attended university there before moving to my post-grad job in New York City. I spent three years there and have since moved back to my original hometown. While I live over half an hour away from my parents' old house and at McDonald's, I still get the chills sometimes if I happen to drive by that strip mall. I've been working at my local McDonald's for four years now, and it's one of the most annoying jobs I've ever had. People coming in left and right and through the drive through with orders piling up was honestly enough to make the average worker irritated. I sure as hell had to go through it all, and there would even be times where I couldn't finish up customers' orders. If you've ever worked at McDonald's, you get where I'm coming from. This happened around a year ago, right before the pandemic hit, and I was working overnight shift on front counter. I usually work in the kitchen on overnight, so I had no interactions with any customers until then. I was working a 7 hour shift, which was a usual overnight shift for us. It was around 9pm and I had just finished putting in a customer's order when I noticed a man talking to a young boy near the play area. Yes, we were still one of the few restaurant chains that still actually had one. The man is kneeled down to the little boy's height and right away the boy seemed very uncomfortable. I dismiss it as the boy probably having a rough day with who I assume was his father trying to calm him down. I remain focused on putting in customers orders and try not to interfere with whatever was going on. Suddenly the man grabs the boy's arm and they're heading in the direction of the front door that leads out into the parking lot. At that point, I couldn't keep my mouth shut and was about to say something when I hear someone yell, Hey, what the hell are you doing with her son? Just then, the mother comes out of the restroom and the man is petrified. His face was pale and his eyes were as big as saucers and tried to cover it up by saying, Oh, this is your child. I'm so sorry. He looked lost and I was just trying to help him find his parents. His mumbles and incompetent use of wording clearly gave away as to what he was actually trying to do. The mother gave him an uncomfortable smile that had stay the hell away from my kid written all over. Police were called but I wasn't sure if he was caught or not. To all those out there who live in areas near wide stretches of empty land like I do, I'm sure you've already been warned why it's dangerous to travel on back roads at night. Growing up in Seattle, one of the biggest cities on the west coast, I never really needed to worry about the dangers of driving in the middle of nowhere until I committed to a college in eastern Washington. For those of you who have never been there, the eastern side of Washington is very different from the western side. Some may even think that they accidentally took a wrong turn into a different state, primarily used as farmland, 
Eastern Washington is almost completely absent from all the elements that give the other side its famous reputation. Instead, this side is mostly just rolling fields of wheat and dried grass that stretch into the distance with a few tumbleweeds and windmills here and there. Driving through this area while the sun is still out is actually quite pleasant on a nice day. The big sky above and nothing but miles and miles of golden hills on each side of you. Driving through eastern Washington at night was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences I ever had. And here's why. If you've ever had to drive down a dark country road at night, I'm sure that you've already been lectured by everybody and their mothers on the obvious dangers like drunk drivers, falling asleep at the wheel, and animals suddenly running across the road. In my particular area, we have a lot of issues with head-on collisions, mainly in part of ANSI students passing cars recklessly in an effort to get home faster. In addition to these more sensible hazards to be aware of, there's also a lot of superstitions like ghosts and murdering hitchhikers that wait on the side of the road at odd hours of the night, begging for a ride. To top it all off, probably the most dangerous part of driving on these back roads at night is the fact that there is no cell service throughout a massive part of the area. So basically, if anything happens to you out here, you're screwed. Because you'll have no way of contacting anyone for help. There is no civilization around for who knows how many miles. And the chances of another car coming by anytime soon is pretty slim. With these dangers in mind, it's safe to say that the story I have for you is about an occurrence that I hope never needs to be warned of again. Now let me begin by saying that the creepiest thing about driving through these empty farmlands at night is by far the lack of light. There is no need for any street lights in the middle of nowhere, and no towns or cities anywhere nearby. The only light besides your own headlights is that of the stars and moon above. It's a surreal experience looking out your window and seeing only the darkness beyond the railing on the side of the road. Mostly because you have no idea what could be out there. And that's why you should be scared of driving on country roads at night. One night, my boyfriend and I were driving home from my cabin in eastern Washington when I noticed a car pulled over on the side of the road. When we passed the car, I noticed that it was completely empty and wondered where the people inside could have gone, considering there was nothing even remotely in walking distance from where we were. I figured that they had run out of gas and had to hitch a ride to the nearest town. My theory of where they had gone prompted my boyfriend to tell me a story that I will never forget. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Washington State had a bit of a cult problem. This wasn't the first time I was hearing of this considering the fact that one of the church camps I went to when I was younger was oddly enough built on the grounds of a disbanded satanic cult. <laughs> who made that decision? Anyways, most of these cults resided over in the east side because of how far it was away from everything and everybody, and they wanted to isolate themselves. These cults could basically do whatever they wanted and fly completely under the radar due to the fact that there was nobody around to stop them, because a lot of the time nobody even knew they were out there. And that's why they were able to get away with what they did. My boyfriend told me that one summer morning, a police station in one of the very few tiny towns amongst the farmlands received a call reporting a missing person. The caller claimed that her husband had not returned from his shift at the paper mill the night before and she was worried that he had gotten into an accident because he hadn't answered any of her calls. Many of the residents in these small towns commuted to jobs way out in the country lands because many of them were either farmers or workers at the local paper mill so accidents at night were not uncommon. The station agreed to send out a patrol car to look for him. At one point along the road, the officer noticed that one of the speed limit signs had disappeared and noted that it may have been the cause of the missing person's presumed accident. Local kids must have been bored, but what else did they have to do out there? The man's car was found pulled off to the side of the road, about halfway through his commute, without a single scratch on it. The man was nowhere to be found, but his car was unlocked and his wallet and cell phone lie in plain view on the passenger seat. Something definitely did not seem right. After weeks of investigation, 
the man was still missing and nobody had any idea where he had gone. For several days, the police station anxiously waited for any news that could solve the mystery behind the disappearance. But because of the usually uneventful nature of the area, the only report called in was that of another missing speed limit sign. A few days later, another call came in. There was another missing person report, almost identical to the one before. Somebody hadn't returned home from their shift the night before. The police sent out a patrol car once again, and sure enough, there it was. An untouched abandoned car on the side of the road, with the missing person's belongings clearly left behind. But there was something different this time. Faint scratch marks could be seen on the driver's seat, that trailed onto the floor and out the door. It appeared that somebody had been dragged from their car. This realization of a possible assault or abduction raised great alarm, and an announcement was made to all local residents to lock their doors on their drives back home at night and be extremely cautious of anybody who may try and approach their car. One night around 2 a.m., the station received a call that would answer their disturbing question of where these people had disappeared to. A couple had been traveling on the road where the people had gone missing and had just narrowly escaped the fate of those before them. They had fortunately heard the announcement a week before and made sure their doors were locked and kept an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. Apparently, a few minutes after they had entered an area void of any cell service, they noticed a single ray of light that appeared to be floating directly in the middle of the road, just a ways down the route. Confused as to what it might be, the couple slowed down cautiously. As they neared the source of light, they saw something that gives them nightmares to this day. Standing in the middle of the road was a chain of people linked together arm in arm, creating a barrier on the street. There was a man in the middle that held a flashlight in his teeth. The car came to a complete stop. There was no way to go forward. Then, what seemed to be a split second after they had stopped their car, out of the complete and utter darkness on each side of the road, two people leapt over the railing and ran towards the car and tried to rip the doors open. The human chain had only been a distraction. Thankfully, their doors were locked and the husband frantically switched their car into reverse and slammed the gas pedal. They had gotten away and immediately called the station once they regained service. When the police asked if they had seen where they had gone as they drove away, they simply answered with, Back into the darkness, beyond the road. An investigation occurred, but the people in the road were never found. To this day, nobody knows who those people were, or where they came from. They eventually did find the bodies of the missing people. Both victims were found bound to what appeared to be a stolen speed limit sign. Their bodies were severely burned. What could be the reasoning behind ripping people from their cars at odd hours of the night and burning them alive out in the middle of nowhere? Without any explanation, the police chalked it up to cult activity. But how could it be possible that there was no trace of these people anywhere? It was almost as if they had vanished into thin air. What's more disturbing is the fact that they could still be out there. All I can tell you is to think twice next time you're driving down a dark country road at night and mindlessly staring into that deep darkness just beyond the railing. You never know who could be staring back. My mom and dad had gone to an adult Halloween party at their friend's house and left me, a 14-year-old male, and my sister home alone to hand out candy to the neighborhood kids. We lived on a small farm surrounded by other small farms and Halloweens were pretty mellow. My sister was 12 and had finally gotten to the age where she thought trick-or-treating and dressing up was embarrassing and I just liked staying home and playing video games with my friends so I didn't usually go out on Halloween. The only issue that night was my parents had forgotten to get candy, so they told us to hand out whatever fruit or pretzels we had in the kitchen. And that was so embarrassing for me, having to give kids something they didn't want on the one night of the year that they were supposed to be getting candy. I wasn't too worried about it, given that not many kids lived in our area, so we figured that we wouldn't have to answer the door much at all. 
We handed out the first batch of apples to disappointed kids, and by 11 p.m., we assumed that we were done for the night. Then came a knock at the door. It was late, and I didn't really want to answer the door again, but I figured it was just little kids, and I didn't want to be rude and ignore them when they could see that the lights were on inside. I got to the door and pulled it open, and was shocked to see four very tall guys standing there, all in mass, holding their pillowcases open, seemingly expecting candy. Sorry guys, uh, we don't have any candy. We've been handing out apples to the kids all night. I have some pretzels if you want some. The tallest one in front just tilted his head at me almost like he was confused by what I was saying, but none of them actually spoke. I didn't really know what else to do, so I started to close the door. When I went to shut it all the way, one of the guys put his shoe between the door and the door frame to prevent me from closing it. I opened the door again to ask him what his problem was, but instead, he and his friends just pushed their way inside. I yelled for my sister to run and hide before being shoved to the ground. One of the intruders pulled out a bat out from under his robe and in a low, deep voice said, We didn't come for any candy. I managed to get onto my hands and knees before being kicked in the stomach, knocking me to the ground once again. I tried screaming, but the thing about living on a farm with more land between you and your neighbors than the average neighborhood is no one is going to hear you scream when you need help, but I kept screaming anyways. It's Halloween. You really think anyone's going to think twice about a kid screaming? And this made the rest of them laugh behind their masks. Look, I don't know what you want, but I, 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 can, I can give you money if you just leave. Please, I, you, you don't need to hurt anyone. I expected a response, but he just laughed at my shaky voice. In a baby talk voice, one of the guys said, Aw, look the little baby scared. Where's daddy to save you when you need him? I felt a stinging at my side as the guy with the bat swung it directly into my ribs. I was trying to listen to the voices to figure out how old they were, and from what I could tell, they seemed young enough to be teenagers. There was a lot of thoughts going through my mind in that moment. I mean, they definitely weren't mature at all, and I crawled to the corner of the room in pain as they spoke to each other about what rooms they would go in and what they were going to take. One of the guys took me outside while the others looked around the house for whatever it was they wanted. I saw my sister on the roof hiding outside her window from the man that I could see had just entered her room. The guy that took me outside had me by the collar of my shirt and was leading me toward the barn. He opened the door to the pig pen and pushed me inside. Threatening me with the bat, he made me roll around in the mud and film me as he forced me to oink. I was terrified, exhausted, confused, embarrassed, and felt completely humiliated at what I was being forced to do. The guy was laughing the whole time, too. He told me to get up and let me out of the barn and back inside the house to show the rest of his friends what he'd done to me, and they only just joined in the torment. They made me drink the toilet water, eat trash from the trash can and other things I can't even speak of as they pulled me around. The whole time I was just hoping they wouldn't find my sister. The strange thing is they hadn't even mentioned her once. They took me to my room and began taking turns throwing punches. I had no idea what I had done to deserve this horrible beating and torture that I was being put through. I was just going through torture in my mind and I had no idea. I almost blacked out many times. Ten minutes into the beating I heard one of them ask me where my sister was. They told me that they wanted to have some fun with her and that they'd stop hurting me if I told them. And this was the moment I decided to stop talking completely. They could hurt me all they wanted. I was not letting them near my sister. They asked me again, spitting in my face each time I refused to talk, but there was nothing they could do to me that would get me to give her up. Eventually they tied me to a chair in the kitchen and just exited the house after thoroughly trashing the place, and I must have blacked out at some point because when I woke up, I was in the hospital attached to just a bunch of machines. My mom was crying when she noticed me awake and took her time to tell me exactly what happened. It turns out the girl I had just broken up with the week before asked her brother to scare me as revenge for hurting her. I guess he and his friends were just insane for taking it to the extent that they did. I guess they just got caught up in it, as disgusting as that sounds. 
Thankfully, they were all arrested, but only the brother was actually sentenced to some jail time. He received five years for aggravated assault and home invasion charges. The other guys got probation as a plea deal for ratting him out. I'm still in a lot of pain since this happened less than a year ago, but I guess there's one thing I'd tell kids answering the door for Halloween when their parents aren't home. Always check your peephole first. I'm a cow farmer in the Midwest. It's not the best work, but it is work, and with how hard it is to find a job with decent pay these days, I've learned to appreciate it. The job entails cleaning up after the cows, checking their hooves, milking, and helping them give birth when necessary. It's a pretty messy job when you look at it from the outside, but i gotten pretty used to it. I don't even smell the stink anymore like I did when I first started. It used to be almost unbearable, but now, really nothing. The farm was my father's before me and his father's before him. And the story I'm about to tell you is my dad's. He told it to me back when I first started the job as almost a uh, what not to do when tending to the animals and working on the farm. He's long past now, God rest his soul, but this story has haunted me for years, so I figured I'd let other people hear it and judge it for themselves. This is back in the 60s when Dad was in his early 20s. He worked on the farm with his father, Bill, at the time. He hated it. He hated the stench that would only get worse when the heat came in the summer and picking up after the cows was the worst. See, the cows stayed in this huge barn. It was actually more like a big warehouse where they're fed and kept throughout the night. They got to graze during the day, and throughout the night the cows would defecate and their feces drop to the concrete floor beneath them. Then in the morning when the cows would go out to graze, my dad would take a really long hose and spray the droppings to the end of the building down a shaft that leads to a big tank below the barn. The tank would fill with the droppings and once a week we had a guy that would come by and empty the tank and dispose of the waste. It was really nasty work, but my dad did it nonetheless. Well, my grandfather decided that was just too much work to do on the farm with just himself and my dad, so they decided to hire another farmhand. They didn't get anyone interested in the job for the first few weeks until they met a man at a local feed store named Fred. He was in his late 20s and eager to work. He hadn't had a job in years and was desperate for pay since his wife was pregnant with their first child. My grandfather hired him right there in that feed store and by the next day, Fred was on the farm working harder than anyone my dad had ever seen work. He was determined and super ambitious. He was constantly running around the farm fixing stuff that needed fixing and trying to learn absolutely everything it was that they did. He loved the job and told everyone how he just wanted to be good at what he was being paid to do. He believed in good honest work and that people should earn the money they're working for. My dad admitted he loved having Fred around not just because he worked hard but also because he was gullible and pretty easily manipulated I guess. My dad had certain tasks given to him by my grandpa throughout the day and each time he was told to do something he just passed that task along to Fred. He didn't mind because he didn't know and my dad didn't care because it meant less of the work that he hated. About four months went by with Fred doing most of the work around the farm and my dad even started to find it a little funny that he really would do whatever he was told. Without question, he was happy to do it. One hot summer morning, the cows had just gone out to graze and my grandpa told my dad to spray the droppings down the shaft at the end of the barn like he usually did. My dad then passed the job along to Fred as he sat along the side of the barn to have a smoke. When Fred was done, he came outside to tell my dad that he had an idea that he thought would highly benefit the farm. He told my dad that if he emptied the tank below the barn themselves, they would be able to use the cow feces as manure in the fields. It would fertilize the plants and make them grow bigger and faster. My dad told me that at first he thought the idea was stupid, but then he figured it would be funny to see if Fred actually tried and emptied that feces tank, so he agreed. He didn't tell my grandpa because he knew he never would have approved and he just wanted to see how this would play out. He showed Fred where to go to the release valve and empty the tank into the big barrels. He told him to be very careful and to not turn the valve too fast, otherwise the line would get clogged and they'd have to call someone to fix it. My dad then left Fred alone to do what he had planned and decided to take a walk around the barn to check the gates and make sure everything was in order. What my dad didn't know at the time was that 
Fred would end up turning the valve too fast, and the line would end up getting clogged. Fred would then open the tank from above and reach a pole into the sludge to try and dislodge whatever was blocking the line. My dad heard screaming coming from inside the barn and he rushed over to see what was wrong. He made his way down into the tank and was horrified by what he found. Fred had fallen into the huge 5,000 gallon tank that hadn't been emptied for a week and was now drowning in the thick feces, desperately reaching out for help. By the time my dad got to the top of the ladder and looked into the tank, all he could see was Fred's hand poking out of the brown goo. He grabbed onto it and tried pulling him out, but he had no leverage at all on the top of that tank. He managed to pull Fred up long enough for him to tell my dad that he was just trying to fix it himself since he knew that they'd have to pay someone for his mistake. He felt bad, and my dad reassured him everything would be okay to just hold on. And that's when his grip failed and Fred plunged back under the thick excrement once again. This time, no part of Fred's body was able to be grabbed onto to possibly rescue him. My dad had no idea what to do so he ran across the farm as fast as he could to get my grandpa, who immediately called the police. And by the time they made it back to the tank, Fred's hand had disappeared under the sludge and there was nothing my dad and grandpa could do but wait. The police showed up with firemen and they didn't know much of what to do either. They ended up reaching a metal pole down into the tank with a sort of loop on the end and when they pulled Fred out, it was very clear that he had passed. My dad was horrified and felt like it was his fault. He knew it was a bad idea, but thought it would be funny. He could have stopped Fred, but his own arrogance let him do it. Fred's wife became a widow and she never remarried. She named their son after him and eventually moved out of town. My dad made a point to work as hard as Fred did every day for the rest of his life in honor of the man whose death he felt he was responsible for. My dad passed away in 2018 and the last thing he said to me was to never take advantage of someone's hard work. I want to start out by saying that I'm a 25-year-old male, average but broad build, and I'm somewhat taller at 6 foot 1 so not what you'd usually consider an easy target or victim. I'm an avid outdoorsman. I love being in the middle of the woods, either with friends or alone. There's a certain peace I find when I'm sitting alone by a stream with nothing but nature all around me. I specifically love hiking, and I usually start hiking in the spring. My favorite spot to hike locally is in a small town in southwest Ohio. This is normally a very peaceful, quiet, and relaxing place. Usually you'll run into a couple of other hikers or families swimming in the creek nearby, or just a few animals along your trail. This day, however, well, it turned out to be entirely different. It started off like every other hiking trip. I grabbed my pocket knife and water bottle and headed toward my spot. Once I arrived, I picked my favorite trail and started down the loop. It was a windy day in mid-spring, and I had been hiking for about half an hour, when I then heard what sounded like a woman screaming for help in the distance. I paused momentarily at the bottom of a small incline, listening closely when I heard the scream yet again. At this time, I ran up the incline to see if there was someone injured nearby who maybe needed help. But when I reached the top of the small hill, my stomach wrenched, and I got the feeling that I should just go on about my business. So following my instincts, I did just that. After that, I stopped a ways up ahead and listened again. I hadn't heard the noise in a while, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't hear it again. The wind blew once more, and the noise came back as the trees swayed back and forth. I decided that the noise was from the trees and just kept on my trail. As I tried to shake the eerie sick feeling in my stomach, I rounded a bend in the trail and as I got to the clearing around the brush, I saw a man on his hands and knees on the ground with his face in the dirt. The man had a dog with him, and he was wearing a backpack. I figured that he had dropped something and was looking for it, so I just kept heading his way down the trail. As I drew closer, the man looked up at me and stood up from the ground. He was a larger guy, probably about six foot four if I had to guess. Pretty stocky build. 
His face looked like that of a drug user. It blocked my path. I stopped about 10 feet from him, standing facing him, maintaining eye contact and distance. He had asked me if I ever smelled these flowers, as he pointed to them on the ground. I then said, No, I haven't, as friendly as I could at the time. He then looked at me and said, Every spring, I have to get down on my hands and knees and smell these flowers. They're just nothing like you'll ever smell. I kind of just gave a, hmm, that's cool. He paused for a few seconds, and I could tell he was sizing me up. After his pause, he said, Yeah, you should smell them sometime. And he paused again, halfway motioning for me to get down and smell these flowers. I said, Yeah, maybe I will some other time. And he then gave me a look of subtle frustration, giving another long pause. I broke the silence by telling him that he has a really pretty dog. Yeah, she's a really good girl, he said. At which point then, I decided I had enough of this interaction, and I said, Alright, well, I'm gonna keep on my way then. The man paused again, and he just told me to take care, and then turned to keep going down the opposite direction of me. I started walking again, and after about five seconds, I peered over my shoulder just to make sure that he wasn't following me but it was gone. He had completely vanished from the trail in just a couple of seconds. You'd think I would be kind of relieved to be away from him, but not knowing where he was really put me on high alert. I decided to try and enjoy the rest of my hike and went down this trail that I had always seen but never explored. The trail then went about a quarter mile through a field with trees on each side of the trail. Then at a sign with a map, split off into three mini trails, that all led to backpacker campsites. As I went down the trail, I stopped for a second to use the bathroom and then check over my shoulder again. Nothing. I made it to the sign at the split and my stomach wrenched again, telling me not to go down that trail anymore, to turn back. So I did. I turned back and I started back down the trail to the main loop. I pulled my knife from my pocket and had it ready in my hand. I was about halfway back to the main loop when I then saw the man yet again in the distance. He had doubled back and was now walking straight towards me again. I've went over this in my head a hundred times and it just didn't logically make sense for him to turn around because it was only about a quarter of the way through his end of the loop. I was about three quarters of my way through the loop since we were heading opposite directions. He walked toward me, a lump forming in my throat and my stomach still turning. As he passed me, he had a look of annoyance on his face. He then saw my hand with my knife in it and just said once more, Take care. And just kept walking past me with his dog. Luckily, that was my last encounter with him and the noises I heard. I'm pretty positive there was no woman at all. I don't really know if he was truly a person or some kind of creature imitating a person. But I don't really care. I think those screams were actually a lure that luckily I didn't fall for. As for the rest of my trip, I hurried quickly out of those woods that day. I do still hike there, and I do still go on that trail, but I now won't do it without my pistol on my hip. I think he planned to trick me into smelling the flowers so he could avoid a fight and then hit me while I was down. God only knows what he would have done. I think because I was armed and I followed my instincts is why I came out of those woods that day. Maybe it doesn't sound so bad in this retelling of my story. But I know what I felt that day. No matter what your gender or size is, you can be a victim if you let yourself be. Always follow your instincts. Always be aware of your surroundings. And always be prepared to protect yourself. Especially if you're alone in the woods. When I was 13 years old, my mom and dad told me that they were sending me to summer camp for two weeks. I was a real homebody when I was that age. And I guess sending me to camp was their way of forcing me to develop social skills before I ended up with some kind of anxiety disorder or something. Looking back, I see why they did what they did. No parent wants to see their kid grow up some weird loner who ends up socially stunted and resentful of the world. I guess attending camp that summer really did make me a little bit more confident and able to handle people. But it definitely wasn't in the way they were expecting. To say I wasn't keen on attending the summer camp might be the understatement of the century. When my parents told me, I almost burst into tears right then and there. 
I promised that I'd do whatever it took to keep them from sending me to some wilderness torture for two weeks, that I'd improve my hygiene and try to be more sociable, but they weren't looking to bargain with me. They were giving me an order. I was going to summer camp whether or not I liked it, and if they had to drag me kicking and screaming onto the waiting bus, so be it. I'll be honest, I cried myself to sleep on the night before the departure day, and I was fighting back tears on the drive out to the bus that would eventually take us to camp. It was only when I was on the bus with the other kids that I was certain I wouldn't cry again, and even then... I think it was only because I was frozen in terror at being in the presence of a bunch of screaming teens. A trio of kids actually asked what my problem was, and all I could do was just sit there, gripped with fear as they began to discuss if I was special. It was completely humiliating, and I actually wondered if there was any way I could escape during a break at a roadside rest stop or something. But then, where would I go? What would I do? It was the very definition of being stuck between a rock and a hard place, and obviously, I chose the hard place over the rock. The first few days of camp were tough to say the least. I barely spoke to anyone, hated the food, and the activities were my idea of hell. I guess I have to say that I was spoiled in that respect, having eaten my choice of foods while sleeping in my very own bedroom, all as an only child so the realities of eating fairly crappy food while sleeping in a cabin that slept six were a devastating shock to the system. My anxiety was bad enough during that first week, but it was particularly intense during mealtimes, and that was all down to the fact that the boys' and girls' camps shared a catering facility. It wasn't all the girls that made me so anxious either. It was one in particular, a girl named Alexandra. She was the prettiest girl I'd ever laid eyes on, Popular, smart, graceful, and confident. I spent almost all of lunch and dinner time staring in her direction, except of course when her gaze turned my way. Then I'd just stare into my dinner tray, hoping she hadn't spotted me looking at her. I somehow said twin prayers that she'd come waltzing up to me to say hello, while also hoping that she'd stay far away and that I didn't become some bumbling, red-faced idiot in front of her. Only one prayer was answered, and it made for one of the most nerve-wracking moments of my life. I'll never forget how sweet her voice sounded from up above me, how she asked if it was okay if she could sit with me for a few moments. I completely failed to give her an answer, but she was confident enough to just smile, giggle, and sit down opposite me, recognizing that I wanted to bask in her presence more than anything else in the world. I only managed to compose myself enough to speak once she started asking me my name and where I was from and that kind of thing. Hearing how curious she was about me and seeing the jealous looks of some of the other boys in the cafeteria, that was the first big confidence boost I'd ever gotten in my life. It didn't exactly tip me over the scales or anything. I was still socially backward and incredibly nervous, but for the rest of the day, it was like I was floating on cloud nine. The same thing happened at dinner the following evening, with Alexandra coming over to talk to me about this and that. Only that time, I actually managed something of a complete conversation. And then, towards the end of my first week, when I'd actually managed to buddy up with two other fairly geeky, socially awkward guys, she finally asked me the faithful question. Alex walked up to the table I was sitting with my two friends at, and asked me if I wanted to meet her down at the swimming lake that evening before lights out. Now, as you can guess, something like that was completely and utterly forbidden by camp rules. The girls and the boys were not allowed to fraternize outside of permitted activities, or in the cafeteria, but then that's what made it so doubly special for me. She obviously liked me enough to risk getting sent home early and completely in disgrace, too. There was definitely a time when an opportunity to get sent home early would have been something that I'd have jumped on, but after meeting and talking to Alexandra, I didn't think that I ever wanted to go back home at all. The risk made it exciting, thrilling even, and as nervous as I was about meeting her in private, I told her, of course, then plotted how I'd make my way down to the lake without being spotted by any counselors. When the time came, my buddies wished me luck gave me some advice on how to keep it cool and play it smooth. Then I set off down towards the lake to meet Alexandra. 
when I arrived, my heart sank when I saw that she was nowhere to be seen. I was convinced that she wouldn't show, that I had gotten all my hopes up for nothing, but I was also terrified to just leave in case she showed up a little late and got the impression that I wasn't interested in her. I stayed for five minutes, then ten, then when I eventually heard someone approaching along the trail. Then, who should emerge from the trees but the object of my affections, Alexandra, and she was carrying two towels. As we talked, I was this mix of nervous and excited and terrified and joyous, but above all, it felt like some kind of victory. I could be sociable. I could date pretty girls. I could probably even be one of the popular kids if I put my mind to it, I thought. That might sound like my ego was inflating to dangerous levels, and you'd definitely be right about that. In fact, by the time Alexandra had actually showed up, it had inflated to the point where I couldn't see how our little meetup could possibly go wrong, and when she suggested we strip down to our underwear and go for a little swim, I was completely blinded by puppy love that I didn't stop to think how that might not be the best of ideas. We did strip down to our shorts, then edged off the dock and into the water. The water was cold, but... That was a godsend in a way because then I could pretend that I was shaking just because of how cold it was and not because I was absolutely overwhelmed with nerves at being in my underwear with such a pretty girl. We swam around for a while, trying to keep as quiet as possible, and at some point, Alexandra brought up that she loved swimming and that she swam competitively for the private school she attended back in Burlington. She told me that she could hold her breath for just short of a minute, that it was a record at her school or something like that and asked if I wanted to see her prove it. I was happy to watch her do just about anything at that point, so of course I said yes. And when she sank under the water, I counted up to 52 seconds until she emerged gasping for breath. I was beyond impressed. 52 seconds is an incredible feat, especially for a girl of her smaller stature. Then, she asked how long I could hold my breath for. I told her I didn't know, but I was only too happy to duck under the water so she could count how long I could hold it for. I remember ducking under the water and hearing her muffled sounds of counting loud in that sweet, lyrical voice of hers. I counted along with it in my head, feeling my lungs beginning to burn for air as the seconds ticked over. But then, she suddenly stopped counting, right as I heard something enter the water next to me. I kicked my legs to push myself back to the surface so I could check out whatever or whoever it was, and that's when I felt a hand on top of my head, pushing me down and keeping me under the water as I tried to resurface for air. I remember opening my eyes to see that Alexandra was no longer in front of me, so whoever was keeping my head under the water was either behind me or above me on the dock. I began to panic, reaching up to pull the hand off my head, but I couldn't do it. I don't think I've been able to drag it off my head at the best of times and I was always a fairly weak kid and the grip was strong. But then since I was dangerously low on oxygen it was completely impossible for me to even budge it. Within a couple more seconds I could actually feel myself starting to black out. My lungs were on fire. It got harder and harder to struggle against the force pushing me down and there came a moment where I actually thought to myself, I'm going to die. The thought caused another spur of panic to run through me, but then after that, and this is the very final thing I remember before I must have passed out, was this weird feeling of peace and acceptance. I wasn't panicking anymore. I just sort of gave up trying to fight the feeling. Then although I don't exactly remember it, I guess I just let myself drift off into oblivion. The next thing I remember, I was lying on the dock, coughing up water while an adult voice was asking me if I could hear them. I was still in a daze and in that moment I couldn't remember what had happened to me. I was just all confused and kind of sleepy. Then as I looked around, I saw Alexandra crying while one of the counselors tried to comfort her. It was only then that I actually remembered the hand holding me under the water how I'd gone from the happiest I'd ever been to thinking I was going to die. I had no idea who'd actually held me under, but 
Alexandra did, and her guilt had her fessing up to the counselor pretty quickly regarding who it was. Apparently, the whole thing had been an elaborate prank to screw with the nervous, overweight kid, but she had no idea that they were going to try to literally drown me out on the lake. From what I gathered, she'd panicked as soon as she saw them keep me under the water so long and had rushed off to get a counselor so they could stop it from happening. The EMTs and the cops showed up not long after I was taken into the head counselor's office and, as you can imagine, it became a huge deal. What was intended to be just some dumb, cruel prank had turned into what the cops were calling attempted murder. The kids did end up getting arrested and taken away from the camp that same night, and the kid who actually held my head down ended up going to juvie for a couple of years, believe it or not. Mom and Dad came to pick me up the next day, too, and Mom gave the head counselor an earful about seeing them in court before basically shoving me into the car. I didn't cry when I went off to camp, but I cried having to leave it. It was a whole mix of emotions, too. Happy to be leaving a place where I almost died, but sad to be leaving my first real friends behind, and sad to be leaving Alexandra behind, too. I know she was the crux of the prank against me, and don't get me wrong, I definitely felt bitter about that, but she also cared enough to run to get help when she realized that they were trying to actually hurt me. I can't tell you how much that meant to me, and looking back, I do realize how crazy that sounds, but in my dumb 13-year-old brain, that was all the evidence I needed that she did actually like me in some way, even if it wasn't the way I wanted. In a bizarre way, nearly dying at that camp turned out to be one of the best things to ever happen to me. I realized that the worst thing in the world, death, wasn't actually all that bad a concept. When it comes to actually facing it, there comes a point of acceptance and peace, and after that, nothing really scared me anymore. I knew I could make friends. I knew I could be brave and so the things that I thought I never could, like talk to girls or learn to skate, and I actually ended up losing a few pounds from actually going outside and socializing with the new friends I made at school through skating. The only big negative that came from it was my fear of deep water. I haven't gone swimming since that day, and the idea of going on a cruise or being out on a boat honestly makes me sweat with fear. Like I said, going to that camp helped me get over my social anxieties in a big way. It came at a cost, I suppose, but I still weirdly am glad I endured the whole experience, because now... I'm not scared of that one thing that grips everyone else and sometimes dictates their whole lives. I'm not afraid of death, and I guess that helps me live a little more than others. Back in the September long weekend of 2011, me and my nephew took my two children, along with three of their friends, to our cabin at a nearby lake for the weekend. Our family has owned the cabin since they moved to Canada in the 1950s. It's located in a very rural area of Alberta. Earlier on the day in question, all five kids had been out of the woods, enjoying a game of tag. Well, not long after they started playing, one of the kids came running to tell me that there was a man wearing a gray shirt crouched in the bushes, and he was watching them play. As you can imagine, I was pretty concerned at this point and I quickly went to check it out, as calmly as possible. At this point, the rest of the kids also said that they had seen a man watching them. I went looking around for the man, but he was gone, and the dense bushes made it even more difficult to find him. At this point, I thought getting away from the cabin for a while might take everyone's mind off of the strange events. So we all packed up the car, and we went to the beach. When we got to the beach, though, there were police cars and emergency personnel all crowded at the beach and throughout the small town. We later found out that apparently two people had actually drowned in the lake that day. And in the end, going to the beach wasn't the distraction we had hoped for. Upon returning to the cabin at around 7pm, we ate food, the kids played, and we all set up beds in one room for peace of mind after the really strange events. Once the kids were in the room for the night, I went downstairs to the living room, which has a really large deck coming off of it, facing towards the woods. There's a sliding patio door leading onto the deck. 
My nephew and I were just chatting when we then heard a tapping noise coming from the back deck. At first, we didn't really think anything of it, but the noise just got louder and way more aggressive, as if it were coming closer. My nephew, who was in his early 20s at the time, came with me. I don't think I mentioned this, but I was a woman in my early 30s at the time, and we went to go check out where the noise was coming from. At that point, we saw a man wearing a gray shirt tapping an axe on the deck. I recognized the man as an ex who we have a restraining order against, and as soon as he saw my nephew, he took off. I immediately called the RCMP, which is the police, and within about 10 minutes, three units then showed up with their guns drawn. Thankfully, all the children were sleeping undisturbed in the bedroom upstairs. The police searched for a while, but they didn't find him, as it was really dark and there was a lot of thick brush surrounding our property. Needless to say, I ended up sleeping in the bedroom with all five kids that night. The next morning, we all packed up and left, not wanting a repeat of the previous night's events. Upon returning to the cabin a week or so later, the word dead was carved into one of the windows that was facing the woods. It was the summer of 2019 and we had planned a road trip from Texas to New York as well as surrounding states. Our road trip was going well. We had ventured through some really amazing states and cities. The travel crew consisted of my husband, two daughters, my husband's parents, and myself. We're pretty self-conscious of the hotels we stay in due to having two small children. Well, a review of La Quinta was really well in a suburb of Washington, D.C., and thus, we chose to stay in that La Quinta. Once we arrived at that specific hotel, we had noticed that the hotel had a really rough surrounding area, despite the entire street being covered with hotels. Radisson, Marriott, True, La Quinta, Days Inn, etc. Just to name a few. However, the shopping complexes and the restaurants near that area seemed rough. My family stayed in the car and I went inside the lobby to pay and check in. While I was walking up to the lobby, there was a lady who followed me from my car to the entrance and asked for money. From there on, many red flags were raised. Once I ran inside, I called my husband to drive the car around. We decided to just go ahead and stay since it was just for one day. We ended up deciding to share a hotel room with my in-laws as the area around seemed really shady and I figured it wouldn't be a bad idea to keep some extra people around. Once we checked in, my husband and I went to go grab some pizza for the family. We brought some pizza and just chilled in the hotel room. Not a bad day or night. The next morning, we went to go grab the continental breakfast. After we had breakfast, I stayed downstairs by the car and started putting luggage in the car that was brought down by my husband and his dad. My mother-in-law was upstairs with my six-month-old at the time and my oldest, who was three at the time, was following my father-in-law and husband. Now, my husband and I always hold both of our kids' hands whenever we walk anywhere, and this wasn't different. My husband was holding her hand. My mother-in-law came down with my six-month-old in hand, along with my husband and his dad, because they forgot something. We decided that my husband and I would stay down and load up the car. My mother-in-law would hold our youngest, and then my father-in-law would go upstairs with our oldest. So we had continued loading the car as my husband's parents then went upstairs to make sure our luggage was down. Afterwards, my husband went upstairs to do a final sweep of the room. Suddenly, my husband then yelled that our oldest wasn't with them. I quickly shut the trunk of the car and went into flight mode. I started screaming her name and running around. My husband was now running around on the second floor, knocking on neighbors' rooms, asking and checking. My husband's parents shut down and started crying. See, the hotel we were staying at was three floors. So as we're running around, I'm downstairs, and my husband's on the second floor, and my in-laws are standing by the stairs, staring into space. We also had some pedestrians help us out and run and look around. The area had police, and they heard me screaming, so the police had arrived within one minute because they heard me screaming for her. The officers also got her description and started asking for a picture. Finally... Our oldest came down from the third floor. We didn't check the third floor because all of this happened within about four minutes and we were looking around. 
we're really thankful we found her. We left that hotel, and now we don't go to any hotel that seems shady at all. We spend the extra money, and we just stay in a nice and secure hotel. We assume she went upstairs because we have stairs in our house, so she went up looking for her dad. However, there was a maid on the third floor who was looking down at us. Her eyes were really emotionless and cold while we were looking. I called the hotel and asked for footage, but we never got anything. We decided to just let it go because our daughter was safe with us. This year, our oldest turned six. We told her about the time that she got lost, and she actually remembered a couple of pieces about it. She told us that the maid had waved at her and went upstairs. Then she heard me scream her name. Parents, please be careful when you go on a vacation, especially if you bring your kids. My husband and I don't leave the kids' side anymore, and we aren't dependent on his parents. So during my freshman year of college, I had a boyfriend who I had just broken up with, and as a young naive freshman in college, I was broken up about it. This was right around the time that I first met my stalker, Scott. Scott was weird as hell, and I really had no interest in him whatsoever. He was once outside my dorm building, and he asked me a question. It was something along the lines of asking me out. I told him no, and that I had a boyfriend which was obviously a lie. I then proceeded to move on from that conversation and interaction and forgot all about Scott. That conversation took place in the fall semester. So right as the year was ending and I was finally back home for the summer, I received a Facebook message from Scott basically saying hi, which then proceeded to tell me that I needed to answer him or he would hurt me. I kid you not, he sent the same exact message over a hundred times. Yes, I counted it. It was terrifying, and I called my mom and I told her what happened and how I barely know this guy and that we only had a one, two second interaction. While I'm on the phone, he had started to write more messages, but these messages were different ones. It was as if he was having a conversation with me, but without me actually responding. One second he was telling me how much he loved me, and then the next was all about how he wanted to hurt me and how he was going to kill me. As you can imagine, after all that, I blocked him. At that point, my mom made me call the police, who came out and took a report, and they basically just told me to report him to the school. My dad ended up calling my school, and he told them that this guy shouldn't be in the same dorm building as me when I returned from fall semester, but they told him that until he physically hurts me, they can't do that. So until he actually went through with his threats, I had to just wait around and watch my back. So after blocking about five different pages from Scott, I didn't hear from him for the rest of the summer. Fall semester rolls around and I didn't see him the first couple of weeks. And then one day, right as I was eating in the cafeteria with one of my friends, he walks up behind me, places a gift bag on my table, and walks away. I tell my friend to throw it away and she says no, she's gonna open it. I didn't wanna open it because he then may have gotten the idea that I liked him and at that point he was totally psychotic in my opinion. She opens it up, and it's my two favorite candies, which how the hell did he even know that? After thinking about it, a few days later, I remembered that I had a model mayhem profile that stated my favorite candy. He obviously searched the internet for me. Anyways, there was also a letter stating that he was very sorry, blah blah blah. So after that day, it was quiet for a while. I would see him, and he would always stare me down very creepily. You know how you stare out of the side of your eyes? Yeah, that kind of stare. So I decided to leave my school and transfer to another school that spring. After leaving, I received more messages from him and I blocked profile after profile. He then tweeted me a bunch of random crazy threats and somehow he had got my mom's phone number. My mom ended up contacting his mother since that was the number he was calling from and she found out why Scott was stalking me and sending me threatening messages. First and foremost, his mom said that Scott was 26, which is really crazy to think that they allowed a 26-year-old to live in dorms with 17 and 18-year-olds. I think college apartments should be for 26-year-olds. Heck, I'm 28 now, and I would never live in a dorm room. Anyways, she also found out that Scott had schizophrenia, and when he didn't take his meds, he would hear my voice in his head. Reminder, I only met this guy once, 
We had a very small interaction, and after that, never even spoke again. How could my voice be stuck in his head? She then proceeded to say that she would make sure he took his medication so that he would no longer contact me. I decided that this was enough and that I needed to get an order of protection against him to have some sort of protection legally. Not that it would make him stay away. It was more of a protection in my head and I never did hear from him again. So Scott, if you happen to hear this and you know who you are, I sincerely hope that you never contact me again. This happened to me at barely 20 years old. I had just gotten off second shift at my job. A couple of friends who also worked with me asked if I wanted to hang out at the beach. I was planning on going home and ordering a pizza and maybe watching some TV. But it was a Friday night in July and going to the beach sounded like a good idea. I'm a female, but two of my friends were male. We had worked and hung out together for around three years so I trusted them completely, and I didn't have any worries about going to the beach with them that late at night. We chose a beach slash park that was in a safe area of where I grew up. As I turned into the beach access road off to the main road, I thought that I'd seen someone walking in the picnic area. I mentioned it to my friends, but they said they didn't see anyone, so I just chalked it up to a shadow from the full moon. I parked and we then got out and started walking to the sand. The night was warm and breezy. I remember we were laughing at something one of us said, and we were all just really carefree. That is, until we saw him. For context, the beach access road sloped down, curving to the right. The road could be accessed from the back of the picnic area by going through a sloped area of the trees. Now, there was a cemented path that led down the beach, but that was farther away from the picnic area. So, this guy chose to keep his balance while fighting his way through sloped trees to get to the road, and I guess to us. And he was fast. The moonlight briefly outlined his physique. He was huge. We immediately whipped around and started running back to my car. And just like a scene in a scary movie, I fell. I didn't care though if I hurt myself or not. So I got right back up and kept on pace. My car was a piece of crap and the doors didn't lock. This was a good thing that night. We jumped into the car, and I started fumbling in my front pocket to try and find my keys. I got my car started, and I put it in drive. I just barely got my foot on the gas pedal before the guy caught up close enough to punch my trunk. I drove right the fuck out of there like a bat out of hell. We drove to a populated area a few miles away before any of us said a word. I had skinned up my knee pretty damn good, as I ripped a hole in my jeans when I fell. I also had road rash all over my hands. I frequented that beach until I moved to another state a couple of years later, but I never went back there at night again. It all started when I woke up to the sound of someone hammering on my apartment door. That was the first fright I got that night, heart pounding in my chest as I grabbed the bat I kept under my bed and headed towards the door. First thing I do is look through the peephole to make sure it's not anyone sketchy, but I'm greeted by the sight of one of my neighbors. She looks terrified. She's covered in blood, and I can see just through the peephole that her face is a mess. I open up the door. She runs inside and immediately says, You gotta get me out of here. My boyfriend's trying to kill me. I start to ask her what happened, and she says something like, There's no time. Just please get me out of here, I swear to God, he'll kill you two for just helping me. That was what sent me into a straight up panic, because if a guy was willing to beat his girlfriend up that badly, Lord knows that he'd be willing to put me in the ground. I just grabbed my car keys, ran downstairs with the girl following close behind, jumped into my car, then took off into the night. I remember asking her if she had anywhere I could take her, like a friend's or a relative's or something. She said no and the best thing for us to do would be to drive to a motel so she could call the cops from there. So, that's exactly what I did. I drove us to a motel and booked us a room. The clerk was obviously just as concerned as I was, but all it took was to explain that her boyfriend had tried to off her, and they were like, jeez, make sure you guys call the cops at least. The girl, whose name I didn't know at that point, I just knew she was a neighbor, 
said that she'd go up to the room and call them, then asked me to get her some ice from the ice machine so she could deal with the swelling on her face. When I got to the room, she said the cops would be there ASAP, took the ice, put it on her face, then just burst into tears. I tried my best to reassure her, telling her she was safe and stuff, then when she finally calmed down, I asked her what actually happened back at her apartment. She told me her boyfriend was abusive, and that she'd been planning on leaving for a while, but that night was the night she'd finally got the courage to gather to announce it to him. She said he walked into their bedroom to find her packing a bag, and not long after that, everything went to chaos. She started helping herself to the little bottle of liquor from the mini bar, but not after promising she'd pay me back for them once everything had blown over. I had no reason to disbelieve her at the time. I mean, I felt like we had a kind of bond established already, but I abstained because I thought I'd be driving back to the apartment pretty soon. I asked her if she was good to wait on her own while the cops drove out to her, but she asked me if I'd stay to keep her safe. She then made the point that if her boyfriend found the blood on my apartment door, she assured me that she'd left some on there while hammering on it, that he'd know she'd been there and he'd try to attack me, or worse. I'll be honest, I thought it was a pretty good point at the time. I hadn't seen the blood myself, but she was so covered in it that I believed her when she said that there was some on my door. Anyway, about an hour goes by and the cops still haven't showed up, and the motel rooms were arranged in a horseshoe shape, so we'd have seen them rolling into the parking lot if they had. I asked her to call them back to see what was going on, because obviously it was a really urgent situation, and I know that there was basically no way for the boyfriend in finding us, but I was still really paranoid that he would somehow. That's when the inconsistency started, because she gave me some lame duck of a reply like, I'm sure they'll be here soon. If that was me, I'd have called 911 again if they hadn't shown up within like 10 minutes. So what was she so calm about that she was just cool with waiting for them for like an hour at that point? I put it down to booze and at that point I was okay with waiting too. It wasn't like I had anywhere to be. I sure couldn't just go back to my apartment with that psycho supposedly just a few doors down. But that's also about the same time that I started checking out the amount of blood on her nightshirt. She had like an oversized t-shirt and girl boxers on and like I said earlier, they were drenched with blood, but also with some blood splattered too, like little spots here and there. She had this cut over her eye and she had a nasty busted lip, but it looked like way too much blood for just those small wounds. So I asked her if she had any other kind of injuries, like an abdominal wound of some kind that might account for all the blood on her. She said no, and that it was all from the busted lip in her eye. And immediately I start smelling nonsense. I asked her again what exactly had happened back at the apartment and she started getting weirdly defensive about what she told me. I was starting to think it wasn't quite the abusive spouse kind of story that she told me the first time around, but I had no inkling of what was really going on. That being said, I was getting tired of waiting for the cops to show so I decided to call them back myself. All I had on me was my wallet, my phone, and my car keys, the only three things I'd had time to stuff into the pockets of my shorts before fleeing the apartment. But when I take my phone out to call the cops, she says something along the lines of, What are you doing? I state the obvious, I'm about to call the cops back, and she's like, don't. I don't know if it was the way she was looking at me, the way she spoke, or the way she sort of tensed up when I told her that I was about to do that, but the mood in the room just shifted completely. I asked her why not, then just went right back to dialing 911. But by the time the operator spoke down the line, I looked up and saw she had a knife in her hand. She just said, Hang up. Now. So I did. I never had a knife pulled on me at that point, and I can't overstate how terrifying it was. It wasn't even just the knife either. It was the overwhelming creepy sensation of knowing that all wasn't what it seemed. I wasn't hiding from the threat. I was with the threat. I'll be honest here. I basically begged her not to hurt me. And to my relief, she said she wouldn't as long as I drove her to the Canadian border. Given this was in Detroit, the border isn't all that far, but I didn't want to catch charges for aiding and abetting or whatever. So I knew I had to think of something to stop that from happening. 
It's not like I knew I couldn't tell the cops that I'd been threatened or whatever, but I also knew that the longer I spent in this girl's company, the more chances I'd have of being stabbed. So, I tell the girl that I drive her to the border, but that I needed to get something to eat first. I play it like I wanted to stop somewhere on the way, knowing she'd reason me down to getting something delivered from a 24-hour joint. She also stated that she'd be the one going down to pick the food up, as she didn't want me having the chance to sound the alarm. That's where she messed up because she didn't seem to realize, to my infinite relief, that I could order from DoorDash and put something in the notes about needing the cops called to the motel. My whole plan hinged on there being a driver around that late at night, but thank God there was, and I was even able to show her the order without bringing up the notes section that mentioned needing 911 called to the motel. And the cops played it perfectly too. They showed up without any lights and sirens on, didn't park in the lot, walked up to the motel room without being spotted from the window, then just knocked on the door like they were a delivery driver. She walks over, opens up the door, then boom, they had a gun and a taser drawn on her before she even knew what was happening. She had the knife tucked into the back of her girl boxers, but the cops were wise to her drawing on them, and she hit the floor hard after they hit her with the taser. Turned out they'd been looking for her because, get this, she was the abusive partner who'd stabbed her boyfriend almost to death before finding some poor schmuck, i.e. me, to drive her to the border. Dude almost bled to death in their apartment but managed to crawl to another neighbor's place to get help. You should have seen the amount of blood in the hallway when I got back to my apartment building and the whole place was crawling with cops and forensic gear. I thought I might be able to drive over to a friend's place to stay the night, you know, contaminating a crime scene or whatever, but they had this section of the corridor closed off so I could actually get into where I lived. The cops came to my apartment in the morning to take my statement down and to fill me in on what they thought had happened. That's how I found out exactly what the deal was. It was 100% the craziest, most frightening thing that's ever happened to me, ever, in my life. And just the fact that I was part of it seems completely surreal to me. But the thing that sticks with me is how easily I swallowed her nonsense story at first. How I thought it was helping someone I knew, someone I could trust, when in reality, one wrong move, and I might not actually be around to tell you this. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. I used to work at a motel that everyone said was haunted. I must have been there for maybe six or seven months, and I hadn't seen anything of the sort. Granted, I don't believe in any of that kind of stuff, so it's not like I was out there with my spook -a meter but one night, I had a little run-in with someone that had me questioning my stance on the supernatural altogether. So at this particular motel, we had what was basically an on-site diner that was just across from the rooms and everything is single story. One afternoon, we were expecting two elderly sisters to check in for a few nights, these two sisters just so happened to be friends of the owners and fairly regular guests who came to stay on the owner's dime maybe two or three times a year. Only, I hadn't met them yet so I had no idea what they looked like or anything. It was way past dark when they arrived so while they're being greeted by the owner and their baggage is being unloaded by some of the other staff, I get the nod to head up to their room with a bottle of complimentary wine. So, I head to the bar in the on-site diner grab a bottle of our best wine, two glasses and a tray, then head out of the back door of the diner and around to the back of the motel. This is a pretty crucial part of the story as I'd been told the wine had to be a surprise. They'd never have accepted it otherwise and the owner wanted a little showmanship for his friends or, more accurately, to make it look like he'd bothered to put some effort into it prior to their arrival. Either way, it meant that I didn't see the old ladies arrive Otherwise, this story basically would never have happened. There's basically no one else around, and right after I put the wine into the motel room, 
I head out intending on scurrying away from the room so that the ladies don't catch me having planted their little gift. Only the opposite way I was due to head, I noticed one of the hallway lights was flickering. I swear to God, it was seriously like something out of a horror movie because I turned to look and underneath the flickering light, wearing a long flowing dress, is a headless figure. At this point, it's important to note something about this whole dumb story about the ghost haunting the motel. Legend has it that it was a hung woman whose body had gone undiscovered for so long that she'd rotted to the point where her neck basically tore apart from the rot and the strain. Therefore, it was a headless ghost that was haunting the motel. I know that's about the lamest ghost story you've ever heard of, right? But then imagine being me, seeing that headless figure standing under the flickering light, and you can imagine why my heart went from zero to sixty as I looked at something that I had absolutely zero explanation for. I think I gasped so loud and so much that my lungs felt like they were about to burst, and that caused the figure in front of me to turn around. Okay, it wasn't a ghost, like I said. There's no such thing as ghosts or spirits or anything of that nature. But there is such a thing as osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a condition that severely weakens the bones of people who suffer with it. And, in older folks, it can mean that they end up with some pretty painful hunching postures, or in this old lady's case, bones so weak that she could barely support her own head. This meant that, from behind, it basically looked like this poor old lady had no head at all. Anyway, she turns around, gives me this look as if she'd horribly been offended by my terrified gasp, and I'm forced to explain it away like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, you startled me. She just frowns, points up at the light, and says something snarky like, better get that fixed, young man, then waddles off along the corridor. I felt like a total idiot. I seriously thought that I was looking at the very same ghost whose existence I'd been denying for months on end. I can't even lie, it was one of the scariest and creepiest moments I think I've ever experienced. So, I've been working as a janitor at the local high school for a few years now, and it's one of the most easiest jobs I've been on. It wasn't a big school, as the town it was in was relatively small, so I was the only janitor working the night shifts. Most of my duties would be to go from building to building, mopping floors, and picking up trash. It was a chill job, but it could get a bit lonely from time to time. One night, I was called into work a bit later than usual, as the other janitor stayed to make up extra hours he had requested. I took his spot once he had left, and pretty soon I was the only one in the building. It was a Monday night if I remember correctly, and I was doing my usual nightly routine of mopping the hallways, when I hear the sound of a door slamming closed. My initial thought was that the door stopper I had placed to keep it open had somehow gotten moved and I go over to see what it was. I could vaguely remember closing every door in this floor, so I was surprised that I had forgotten to close one. I go to the classroom where I heard the noise and peek my head inside expecting to find the stopper on the floor. Sure enough, the door stopper was on the floor and that's when I noticed something else by one of the metal cabinets. It only took me a good second to realize that there was a finger wrapped around it. Because of the angle, I didn't see who was hiding behind there and I sure as hell didn't want to know. I locked the door and didn't spend another second in there and practically ran outside the building calling security. When they showed up, I led them to the room where I saw the person hiding. However, by the time we got there, there was nobody inside and the window was left wide open. The whole ordeal didn't make any sense as we were on the third floor which was about 40 feet from the ground so there was no way he would have survived a fall like that. The security guard gave me an annoyed type of look as if he didn't believe me. 
I explained what I saw to my girlfriend, but instead of believing me, she went on to lecture me about how I wasn't getting enough sleep. Looking back now, I don't blame her, but I know what I saw. A few days later, one of the janitors was working the night shift as I had called in sick that day. He was mopping the floors of the second building when he found a dirty homeless man inside one of the storage closets. The man attacked him with a large butcher knife causing a truckload of blood to spill. Thankfully there was an officer on standby and must have heard the commotion from upstairs. Long story short, the cop tases the man and was obviously arrested. Thankfully, the other gender had survived but had to have several stitches done. I still don't know as to how the man had managed to get in the school without being caught. School security was pretty strict about letting outsiders in unless it was a parent or something. I worked that job for another month after and never saw anything abnormal again. When I was about 19 or so, I got my first ever real job working at a gas station during the spring. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was enough to get my foot through the door to start making payments for college and stuff. I lived by myself in a small one bedroom apartment that my parents paid for, but got the job in the meantime to cover other expenses. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of night shifts knowing I had a 7am class every morning. It was annoying to say the least, but I really needed the money. During the night shift, you'd have people constantly come in and out for gas, and right around the 10pm mark, business would be slow for the most part. After that, you'd maybe have one or two shady people come in once an hour for a snack or cigarettes. That being said, it's still a pretty good time where I could chill out for a few hours. One night, I was on my shift as usual and had just finished serving what I thought was the last customer for the night as I was about to end my shift. As I'm packing up and getting ready to leave, a car pulls up right in front of the store and a man gets out. He wore a stained white shirt and had a scruffy beard with messy hair. He walks right in and I greet him with a hello and ask if I could help him with anything. He completely ignores my question and walks over to the refrigerators and grabs a six pack of beer. I live in the south, so people like this were very common around here. I tell him his total and he then says something that made my skin crawl. Hey, you're really pretty. I love your hair. Laughing awkwardly, I tell him thanks and he proceeds to hand me a $10 bill, making sure our hands touched. I give him his change and tell him to have a good rest of his night and go on my phone, hoping he get the hint to leave me alone. He thankfully left and I waited for my coworker who was working after me to arrive so I could go home. However, he must have been running late because it was 10 minutes past his shift and I was getting a bit annoyed. 10 minutes turned into 20 and then eventually 30. As I was about to call him to see where he was, I then noticed someone hiding behind one of the gas pumps. It was a little hard to see, but because of the light, I could make it out to be the same man from earlier. I had no idea as to what he was doing, but I could tell that it clearly wasn't good. He then comes out from behind the pump, and I see that he's clearly hiding something behind his back and I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I grabbed my keys and was headed out toward my car, when I see him approach the front door giving me this unsettling look. It was a look of hatred and fury. 
Suddenly he pulls out a gun and proceeds to show it to me as if he wanted me to know that he was armed. At this point I'm frantically dialing 911 on my phone and he then shoots the lock and steps inside yelling at me while having me at gunpoint. He orders me to give him all the money in the register or he won't hesitate to pull the trigger. I take a few deep breaths and calmly hand him the money we had, and he then takes off down the road. I call the police while bawling my eyes out in fear, and the operator tells me to stay on the line with her until an officer arrived. Thankfully, the guy never made it too far, as police had managed to track him down. Turns out, this guy was wanted for sexual assault and murder. His victims were two family members, one of them being his wife, one widower, and two gas station employees. Just. Like. Me. The next day, I quit my job at that gas station and now work at my local supermarket. So, this happened a little over two years ago. It was late 2016 and I just started my new job at a motel. It was low pay but I needed an office job as it was required for my training. One of my friends, Michael, got me this job. For a few days I did training with the owner in the mornings and for two nights Michael trained me. Our job was the 11pm to 7am shift. Nothing too exciting, just checking guests in and doing paperwork. My boss, who is the owner, went away with his wife on vacation for a week, which is attributed to the swift training I had to endure. So it was my first night alone on the night shift. There was a monitor with security cameras around the motel's property and large glass windows all around the office building with a glass door, and there was no night window like most motels have. It was fairly early in the night, at about 1am. I was just doing my normal paperwork when a man walks in and asks if we have any rooms available. Usually if someone is sketchy, my boss has me lie and say no, but he seemed normal at the moment. However, we just had a meeting on customer satisfaction and our boss was really encouraging us to be more polite to guests. Without hesitation, I said, uh, yes of course, just for one? And he replies, yes. So I begin creating the reservation on the computer when I notice he starts swatting in the air and making spitting noises, as if he were being surrounded by flies. I tried to ignore it, and as far as I was concerned, it wasn't my business, so I try to check him into the room as quickly as possible. I give him his key, and he's on his way. At this point in time, I could be described as very timid, and had a lot going on in my personal life. So I hope you could all understand my reaction to what happens next. The man comes back from his room and slams his hand on the glass door and causes me to jump. Absolutely frightened, I look up to see him just staring at me. He cracks the door and puts his head through and says, I can't get into my room. Why won't you let me into my room? My only defense is trying to be helpful, so I replied with, Oh, um, maybe there's something wrong with your key. Here, let me give you another one. The look he had in his eyes was inexplicable. I felt like I was in absolute danger. I handed him his new key and he went back to his room. I tried texting Michael because he was the one who trained me. Though it was in the middle of the night and he was asleep, I needed some guidance. With no reply from Michael, I noticed the man trudging down the stairs to come back and I go to absolute panic mode. I run into the back office and lock the door, and I pull out my pocket knife. It's important to keep protection when working at night. All the while, I hear the man in the office yelling, Hello? Hello? Why won't you let me into my room? Do you not like me? Me being an absolute idiot and not standing my ground and calling the police when I'm feeling scared, I decide to take the situation on alone. I reply with, I'm just on the phone. I'll be right out. I then start calling Michael over and over for help, but no answer. I decided to take a few deep breaths and then step out of the office. However, the man was not there, but rather in the bathroom. 
I start hearing him talking to himself, saying, Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. My heart sank. Still being an idiot and not calling the police, he comes out and I say, Oh, uh, your key was broken. I'm sorry. Let me escort you to your room. He agrees, thankfully. I was wearing a long sleeve sweater, so with my arms down, I was able to hide my knife in my hand while holding it. I begin to walk outside, and he seemed insistent to walk behind me. We begin making our way to the staircase and up towards his room. I was sweating from how nervous I was, cautiously looking behind me to make sure he wasn't going to make a move. He stops at a room, and I stop at his room a few doors down, I smile and I say, Oh, that's the wrong room. This is your room. As it clearly said on the door. The whole time, he was going to someone else's room trying to open the door. I quickly ran back to the office and locked the door. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a few towns away. I felt bad for him about the guy, but they seemed willing to keep an eye out and ear out. The next night, the man came back but had the doors locked and told him we were all booked up. I explained to my boss what happened when he got back from vacation. However, he didn't take me that seriously. I continued to work there on the night shift for the next year, where many other strange encounters happened. So, strange man, let's never meet again. If you ever feel uncomfortable, always call the police. I'm a 15 year old male, I live in Germany, but I come from a small European country. This event had happened before I moved to Germany. In my country we have field trips, usually at the end of 8th grade, that last for a week or so. Now, I've had my fair share of stalkers, but nothing like this. It was September in 2014 and I went to a field trip on an island with my class. I was 14 at the time. There was this girl Jane, Jane used to be a normal girl up until that point. She was always kind of shy and really kept to herself, but everyone liked her. She was never bullied or anything, just a normal shy girl. We used to chat on Facebook a little bit, but nothing serious. I never really harbored any feelings towards her, neither in her favor nor against her. Now, back to the field trip. I've smoked a couple of cigarettes with my mates in our hotel room, and then we met outside. The teacher wanted to show us some plants that were specific for that area. Now, I've noticed that Jane was talking to me more often than before, and that she had walked very near to me, but I thought that that was merely a coincidence. I didn't make a fuss about it, but as time went by, things had started to get worse. She started touching me, hugging me, and following me, respectively. On the third day, we went on a cruise to a nearby island, and during the cruise, she was sitting next to me. She had a camera and was taking pictures of me. I had zero sense of restraint at that point since I was young and didn't think much of it. I've noticed that she was taking a suspicious amount of photos, mostly of me, and I told her to calm down. Then she talked to me for an hour, but she didn't say anything interesting. She was mimicking the Irish and British accents to me and basically blabbering stuff for approximately an hour. And I was just smiling and replying with, That's nice. In the following days, she had started to hug me and make me feel uncomfortable, so... One day I came to her and told her that we needed to talk in private. We went to the woods and I asked her if she was in love with me or something like that. She denied it and kept saying that there had been a misunderstanding, but I knew that there was something off about her. Then she told me her life story. She said that her mother is a schizophrenic and that she's severely depressed about it. I felt sorry for her, but still her and that touching was incredibly inappropriate. During our conversation, my mates wondered where I am and organized a search party for me. They found us eventually, but she had decided to stay behind and let me go. I have no idea what she was doing after I left. On one occasion, I'm a little fuzzy about the details, she came into our hotel room asking for water, as if there wasn't any water in her own room. However, when she got the requested water, she refused to leave the room. We got rid of her by telling her that we were going out to have some fun. The next day, the harassing got even worse. She would follow me around and hug me. The peak of her abnormal behavior happened in the evening. I took a walk with a friend of mine and turned around briefly only to see her behind us. She was following us, I kid you not. 
I have never felt this kind of dread in my whole life. We have made our way down the shore and I hid behind a big rock next to a police station. We should go inside and tell the police we have a stalker, my friend joked. Anyway, she couldn't find us and gave up finally. My best friend heard the story and went to her room to tell her to screw off. I was infuriated with him because it was rude of him, regardless of her actions. I'm usually not meek, but I thought that was horrible. Now I see that no matter how cruel that was, it was the right thing to do. I went to her room and apologized for my friend's actions. She was in her bed sobbing uncontrollably, and I calmed her down and went outside. A female friend of mine, Sarah, had invited me to come to her room so we could discuss something. I made my way to her room and saw two other girls there. We sat in the chairs in her balcony and she had told me that Jane is a very depressed person who had done some self-harming in the past. I was shocked when I had heard that. So, amidst our conversation, I winced. I raised my look and saw Jane, maybe 50 meters or 160 feet away, just sitting on a rock listening to music and staring at me. She had a solemn look in her eyes. I suddenly felt dismay and told my friends that we have a spectator. They winced too and we decided to pry on her a little bit before backing out to the bedroom. Just stay away from her was the last thing Sarah told me before I left. To my luck, it was the end of our field trip and I finally got some rest. Weird encounters with her became fewer and fewer because she was often absent from school. Later I found out that she had overdosed on sleeping pills a couple of times but survived all of those occurrences. There was even a rumor that she had ended up in a psychiatric institution but I have no proof of that and I can't tell you in confidence. The point of the story is that sometimes you have to be rude so you can prevent something like this from happening to you. It may seem cruel or it might even hurt the other person but in the end it's your life and you have to stand up for yourself and make sure that you're happy first. This happened to me some time ago, back when I was 10. On a field trip to a group of cabins some 70 kilometers or so from the city I lived in. The point of the trip was basically just to have fun. We weren't being taught much other than how to make shelters and light a fire in the rain. For the most part, we were supposed to spend the majority of the time just fooling around, playing tag and swimming in the nearby lake and maybe playing board games inside the cabins when it was pouring outside. Things turned out to be less fun, at least during the first two days. At first, the trip seemed great. We got to choose our own roommates. There were four rooms in each of the four cabins, and my group of friends and I obviously chose one together. There were four of us in total. Myself, an Indian guy, a Canadian, this happened in Canada, and a Chinese guy. Neither of us had ever been on a trip like this before, so far from home and in the middle of a mountainous forest. When we got there, we took a tour which was led by the camp's coordinator, this 20-something year old with shoulder-length blonde hair. He showed us the cabins, the lakes, the trails, and the kitchen and lunch rooms, and then stressed us that it was important that we not wander off far from the cabins since being in a forest at the base of a mountain, the chances of getting lost were relatively high. So we finished the tour, ate dinner, and then we were guided to bed, as we had arrived somewhat late. My friends and I were extremely excited, what with this being our first time sleeping away from home and everything. The Canadian friend had the, at the time, seemingly brilliant idea to share ghost stories while we got ready for bed. We each came up with a fictional character that would creep out kids or murder people or something. I came up with this idea of someone called Psycho, who would hide behind the shower curtains and then stab you when you stepped inside. For the record, no one showered during the four days we were there. The Indian guy came up with this typical under-the-bed monster who would grab your legs as you got close to the bed frame and drag you under. As the hours passed and lights out drew closer, we started to get the creeps. By the time the lights out hit two hours later, we were so high-strung with a combination of excitement and nerves that everyone, excluding me, decided to share one bed, even though there were two of them. The Indian guy's story about the grabbing your ankles and being dragged under the bed monster unnerved us to the point that we jumped onto the beds from nearby pieces of furniture rather than have to walk near the bottoms. As I mentioned previously, I decided to sleep on my own because three people in one bed, even ten years old, was awkward and this being summer, it was hot. We talked for a bit before turning off the lights and falling asleep, but I was awoken some hours later by what sounded like whispering. 
I didn't move at first, since the stories we had shared while getting ready for bed were still in my mind. And then I recognized the voices, and realized my friends were the ones whispering from over on the other side of the room in their bed. So I relaxed for a moment, and I was about to call out and ask what they were discussing when the Indian guy, apparently unaware that I had woken up, hissed, What's it doing? Immediately, the thought of some monster looming over my bed took to my mind, and I froze, eyes darting around in the darkness. I didn't see anything, as the room was empty and it was too dark to make out the distinctive forms of my friends in the other bed. It's looking at him, said the Chinese guy, and then added, Do you think it will break the window? And then I looked at the window. It was one of those floor-to-ceiling ones with a latch that opened up to a balcony. Standing in the balcony, pressed up against the glass, was the silhouette of a person. The curtains were drawn, but they were white and thin, and we could still see the warped shadow of the person, illuminated from behind by the dim light of the moon. The man, it was almost certainly a man, was holding a long pole with a wide end, similar to a sludge hammer or even an axe. I whispered, Guys? The man outside didn't move, but the Chinese guy did. I didn't know how he even worked up the courage to do this, but he crawled out of bed and slowly worked his way to the side of the window, duck low, all commando style. He reached forwards, grabbing the curtains, and was about to peek between the fabric when the man outside knocked on the glass. The poor Chinese friend jumped so badly that he pulled hard on the curtain, causing the entire thing to rip off the railing, letting us see the person outside. He was dressed in black, aside from a pair of orange shorts, and had a ski mask on. What he held in his hands was actually a shovel, rather than a hammer or axe. Nevertheless, the four of us were terrified. The Chinese guy screamed and bolted for the door, and in less than a second, the four of us were scrambling out of bed and hightailing it for the exit, screaming all the while. My Indian friend tripped along the way, and the Chinese friend was in such a rush that he slammed into the door, causing the lock to nearly snap. In seconds, we were in the cabin's lobby, and everyone else was rushing out of their rooms to see what had happened, teacher included. She had her own room. We told the teacher, in terrified gasps, what had happened, and she went to investigate, but found nothing. The person had disappeared. After that, it took about an hour before we were convinced to even step back into our room. I clambered into bed with my friends despite their protests, and we stayed awake for the remaining four hours or so, hands clutched around our flashlights. The curtains remained open. The next day passed normally, and though we talked about the event, we soon forgot ourselves in the blur of activities that the camp counselors set for us. We ate lunch, fooled around, ate dinner, and then, with no small amount of dread, walked back to the cabins and got ready for bed. The same guy actually came back, but to a different cabin this time. When we woke up and headed for breakfast hall, a group of girls were talking about the man with the shovel, and after talking with them for a bit, we realized that they had experienced the same thing as us. We were just about to go to the teacher and explain that there was someone out there trying to murder us little kids when the camp's coordinator, a 20-something with blonde hair, walked into the breakfast hall wearing the exact same orange shorts the man outside of our balcony had been wearing. He denied everything when our group questioned him, and we didn't dare take the matter to the other camp counselors or even our teachers. The rest of the trip was uneventful, but judging by the shorts, it was almost definitely him. At the time, it freaked me out to think that one of the camp's counselors was doing this sort of thing. We suspected him for murder and a whole host of other things, but looking back at the trip, he was probably just a bored young adult trying to make an otherwise repetitive job as a counselor more exciting. Still, I hate to think about how depraved he must have been to scare ten-year-olds in that way, possibly leaving them with trauma or emotional scarring. It was the summer of 2013, and I was on a field trip with my summer camp to a water park in West Palm Beach, Florida. I was 14 at the time, and the whole purpose of this trip was for our end of camp activity. It was a relatively large water park with water slides, a lazy river, and lots of other water activities. 
When we got there, our camp counselors had told us that we could split up in groups but to check back at the meetup spot every three hours. My friends and I had went on to do our own thing while making sure to stay together as this place was huge. Fast forward about an hour later, two of my friends wanted to go on a water slide that I couldn't go on due to my size. I'm a big guy, 6'4 and weigh about 200 pounds and this water park took heights and weights very seriously. As I'm waiting at the bottom, I notice a man talking with a young boy who looked to be around 6 or 7 who I assumed was his son. In that moment, I didn't think anything of it until he immediately said something that caught me off guard. Oh, I just so happen to have some ice cream in my car. Let's go get some. At that point, I found myself looking toward their direction and they both walk off with him grabbing the kid's hand. Thankfully, my friends had just gotten out and I told them everything I had just witnessed. With Alex being the oldest and a camp counselor assistant, he runs after the man and grabs him by the arm pulling him down. However, the fight was over within seconds with Alex giving him blows to the head. Security had come and told everyone to back away. They then of course arrested the man and took him to the front entrance where police would be. Thankfully, the boy's mother had come back and was crying her eyes out. Turns out, the mother had left him there while her and her older daughter went onto the ride as he was too young to ride. She was apparently also charged with leaving her child like that and wasn't sure what happened with her daughter. I still give Alex credit for stepping into a situation like that as when he sees something, he says something. This took place when I was around 23 years old, back in 2014. I used to work as a summer camp counselor at a Jewish community center in Florida. I was one of the counselors for a younger group of kids, and oftentimes the camp would take about two field trips a week to various places. Whether that be the aquarium, a water park, or even the beach, it would always be something fun and entertaining for all the campers and staff. One day, our group was going to the Museum of Science, which basically consisted of solar systems, planets, marine animals, and other cool attractions. Our supervisor told every counselor to take a separate group of kids and take them around the museum, but to meet back every hour. I mean, the place is huge, so it was no big surprise that we had to meet up. Anyway, I had been assigned to take four kids from the group and keep a close eye on them as we explored different sections of the museum. For privacy reasons, I'll call the kids Michael, Jay, Cynthia, and Samantha. We stopped at the marine exhibits, looked at some animals, and I even let the kids play in the kinetic sand pit they had. These kids were in the 6 to 9 age range, so I let them have their fun with me helping them once in a while. After about 45 minutes, we were in the astronomy section when I did a head count of all the kids and realized one of the kids had been missing. The missing child being Jay. I quietly cussed to myself and looked around asking the others where the hell Jay went. Samantha spoke up first and said that he went with the pirate to go find the treasure. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach as she said this, and I immediately call our supervisor to explain the situation. As I'm talking on the phone with him, I see a very tall man grabbing Jay by the arm in another room. From the looks of it, Jay was clearly uncomfortable and terrified. Thankfully, my supervisor had come along with the police. The police had placed the man in handcuffs and brought him over to Jay to ask him if he knew this man. He didn't. The man was arrested and was placed in prison for God knows how long. Apparently, the police had searched this man's house and found tons of illegal pornography on his computer and had a history of pedophilia. I got fired from my job after that incident, even when I took responsibility, 
and I now work at a store in a shopping mall. Back in high school, I used to be part of the honors classes. I'm sure by now most of you know what honors is, but for those of you who don't, it's basically special courses for higher achieved level students. Basically, the smartest of the smart. Now, I'm not sure how other schools do it, but my school had several field trips planned throughout the year. One of them involved going to the Stanley Hotel, which is said to be one of the most haunted hotels in America. On top of that, it was also featured in the hit 1980 movie, The Shining. I never really believed in the paranormal. I thought the whole thing was BS just so people can get views for fabricated videos. This trip was for our history class, and with our teacher being super into this kind of stuff, he didn't hesitate. When we got there, the tour guide gave us a small tour of the main lobby and gave us info on the hotel's history. About 10 minutes into the tour, I began to get bored and remember wandering off into this other room to look around. In this room, laid a piano surrounded by those red ropes you'd see indicating that it was just for display. I, for some reason, found this piano amusing, which is weird considering the fact that I was never into music. I get a little closer, and right then, I hear clear as day, a single keynote from the piano. I jump back in shock, figuring that it might have been a chord or something that snapped from the inside. It was at that point when I noticed an older man in the room with me. He nods his head at me indicating that he heard it too, which made my skin curl. I remember getting out of that room as soon as I could, and the second I did, I heard what sounded like crumbling of falling bricks. This whole section had walls made out of them, but all of the bricks in the walls were intact, meaning that there was no damage, so I wasn't sure as to where the sound was coming from. I hurried back to the tour, not telling anyone about what I had just heard. We finished the tour, and after it was done, I went up to the tour guide and decided to tell him. He had this shocked look on his face and told me a story about a hotel maid that used to work here. She had died about 20 years ago in this hotel and loved the piano, which guests claimed to have heard. I have never believed in the paranormal, but I have no other explanation for this. This took place back in 2016 when I was a junior in high school. I was around 17, which is the typical age for an average junior. Our class was going on a day field trip to a nearby wooded area by a lake to learn about some plants and study them. It was for our earth science class and the objective was to use the so-called skills we learned in class to identify which plants were which. It was kind of like a scavenger hunt, and the group with the most plants found got extra credit or something. Our teacher allowed us to split up, and my friend Colin and I wandered off to go explore. We had found one bizarre looking plant and identified it as a passion flower, a common plant native to Florida. We continue our walk, and eventually come to a clearing full of grass that was about knee high. From there on, we had identified two other plants that we were supposed to find, and after about an hour of playing Pokemon Go, we decided to head back. It was around 5.30, and the sun was starting to set, and the bus would be leaving at 6, meaning we had to get back soon. So, there we are, walking through the thick brush, when Colin stops me dead in my tracks and shushes me. Dude, do you hear that? Upon the crickets chirping, I listened closely and heard the sound of what I thought was crying. It was coming from the left, about maybe 25 feet away, deeper into the woods. Colin, being the invested person he was, decided to go see what it was. Figuring that it might have been another student in need of help, I decided to go along. We walked through the thick brush, with twigs and branches hitting our faces the further we went. 
The closer we went through, the more clear the crying got. By now, the sun was almost set and we had to turn on our flashlights from our phones to light our way. Suddenly, Colin stops and puts his arm in front of me and tells me that it was coming from behind one of the trees. He points to a large tree about a few feet away and the crying was clearer than ever. I tell him that we shouldn't go over there and that something didn't feel right. Colin, being the tough guy he was, ignored my advice and walked over while I made my way back to the bus. Not even 30 seconds later, I hear Colin scream at the top of his lungs. I see Colin come running toward me, grabbing onto my hand and bolting it to the bus. All the while, I'm trying to question him while we practically ran for our lives, but he wouldn't answer me. As we were running, we could have sworn we heard something from behind us, but we genuinely didn't care. We thankfully made it back to the bus, just in time, hyperventilating. There were a few students who looked concerned, but we refused to reveal anything fearing we'd get into trouble. Throughout the bus ride home, I tried every attempt to convince him to tell me what he saw, but he gave no response. From that point forward, we didn't mention anything about this to anyone, even our parents. Colin and I are still friends and are now both in our last semester of college. Till this day, Colin still refuses to tell me as to what it was he saw and I'm not sure if I'll ever know. Sometimes I'll look back on that day and think about going back to the lake to try and listen for the crying again, but I'm not sure I want to. For a very short period of my life, I want to say it was around the time I was the age of 15 or 16, I lived in a fairly small house in Vermont. My family didn't live there long. It was located in the forest and far from almost everything, making any task that required leaving the house pretty inconvenient. However, there's one experience I had at that house in the time I lived there that I'll likely never forget. It happened in January. I only remember that because I can recall New Year's Day being just a few days earlier. My cousin Jason and I were both still on school break at the time and had planned to spend the night at my place. This was something we would often do. We would typically stay up till 2 or 3 a.m. playing Xbox, watching movies, or something along those lines. This would all happen in the living room. This night, we had been watching a movie. I don't remember what movie it was, but that's not important. What I do remember is being maybe halfway through the movie when Jason kept looking out the window just slightly to the right of where we were sitting. It got to the point where, like every minute, I could see his head move out of the corner of my eye. Now, I should mention, on that night, there was a fairly bad snowstorm happening. At first, I just thought he had been watching the snowfall, until I realized just how long he had been staring out the window for. I asked him what he was looking at. He kept staring, and responded saying how he thought he saw something. This instantly filled me with anxiety. I think this was mostly due to where we lived. Wild animals weren't all that common, and like I mentioned earlier, we didn't really live near anything. So someone on our property, especially at this hour and during a snowstorm, would 100% be cause for concern. Nothing happened for a couple minutes. I kept asking follow-up questions, but he just told me to be quiet, like as if to be able to focus. That's when we saw it. The clear shadow of a person sprinting from one tree to the next. Both of us physically jumped in reaction. There was no sound, but the sheer sight alone was enough to startle us. Now, this was a good 200 feet out from the house, so we couldn't exactly tell if the person was coming closer or not. We both looked at each other and right back out the window, I guess as a way to confirm what we just saw. A couple minutes of this went by, when it happened again, but this time much further to the left of where the first sighting had occurred. Slowly over time, the sightings would become more frequent. It was clear by this point that there was more than just one person. Eventually, one of the figures got out from behind a tree. But this time, instead of moving behind another one, it just stood there. And after a couple seconds, the figure started sprinting in our direction. This was enough to break us out of our sort of trance of disbelief we were in and run. 
I ran straight upstairs to wake up my dad. But by the time he got up and followed me downstairs, there was no one visible outside. Jason and I both explained to him what we had seen. Typically, I don't think my dad would have believed us, but I guess he was able to see the genuine panic in our eyes. We all went around the house, verifying all the doors and windows were locked. My dad then went outside armed with a weapon. He briefly walked around the house before returning inside, but he found nothing. That night, we convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us. Come morning, and the snowstorm had almost completely stopped. We went outside to better assess the situation in the daylight, and we would find multiple sets of footprints in the snow next to the trees facing our living room's window. They were pretty filled in from the snowstorm, but still clearly visible and recognizable as footprints. There were even some around the house, like on top of the footprints my dad had made the night before. I even talked to my dad about it, and he said those had not been there when he went outside. Even more disturbing was how our shed had been left completely open, with the only things stolen being our knives we used for hunting. None of this, however, would be enough to get my dad to call the cops. He always had this, we take care of our own mentality, and I guess he just never saw calling 911 as an option. We moved out of that house two weeks later. Not because of the incident, rather, that just so happened to be when we had planned to move. I was extremely grateful for this. At least as far as I know, nothing happened in those two weeks. This whole experience still freaks me out to this day. Seeing firsthand multiple people on your isolated property in the middle of the night and during a snowstorm is straight out of a nightmare. And I do my best not to think about it. For a long time, just about every day on my way to work, I would stop at Dunkin' Donuts and get some coffee. I've been doing this for a while, and I'd stop at the drive-thru and pick it up. A while ago, I went there one day to the same location that I always did. It's close to my house and on the way to work, right before I get onto the freeway. One morning it was just like any other. I got ready for work, left my house, and then went to Dunkin'. When I got to the drive-thru, it was busy like usual. Eventually, I placed my order and got around to the window and paid. When I was there, they told me to pull around and park in the parking lot, and they would bring my drink out to me shortly. This was strange. I had never had to do this before, especially because I just got one drink and not a huge order. I drove and found an open parking space in the front of the building. I was thinking maybe they ran out of one of the ingredients in my drink and had to get more or something like that. I waited for a few minutes and was just browsing my phone. Then finally, I saw somebody approach my driver's window. They weren't carrying a coffee, though. I rolled down my window to them. It was a guy with long hair and a black shirt. I thought he worked at Duncan at first because of his shirt, and he also had a Duncan hat on, but the man just stood there and stared at me. I rolled down my window and asked him what was going on. The man stood there staring at me for a moment, then said in a loud voice to get out of the car. My instincts were telling me to leave, so I backed out. The man just stared at me as I did and watched me leave. I drove away and went to work without getting coffee. The next day, I saw that the Duncan location was closed, and when I looked online, it said temporarily closed, but I couldn't find any information as to why. After that, I started going to another place for coffee in the morning instead. to work at a Dunkin Donuts about three or four years ago. I only worked there for about three months and the job wasn't really for me. When I worked there, I would do a little bit of everything and was often helping people in the drive through One day when I was working, a man came through the drive through and ordered a coffee. When he got to the window and I handed it to him, he asked me for my number and he seemed sort of creepy. I told the man no but tried to be nice to him. He seemed a lot older than me was a big guy with a slight beard and brownish hair that was messy. The guy said okay to me and then left. Things like this didn't happen often, but would occasionally, and normally it wasn't a big deal. But later in that day, the man came back. It was about two hours later, and he walked inside the restaurant this time. I had moved to working near the front counter, and didn't even remember him at first because of how busy we had been. It wasn't as busy now, though, as it was later, 
and the man came up to the counter and asked me if I remembered him. At that point is when I did, and he started talking to me, asking me if I wanted to go out with him. I told him that I was working and I didn't want to. I then told him I didn't have time to talk, and if he wasn't going to order anything, I had to help the next person in line. He then put his hands up and said, all right, and then started to walk away. It was the afternoon now, and we closed at 8 p.m., so I only had a few hours left. I got back to work and didn't see the man again during my shift. The last hour was very quiet, and as the sun set and it got dark out, we would rarely get very many customers. My coworker Anna went to sweep the floors of the restaurant, which is something that we usually did shortly before closing. I started to do some cleaning behind the counters. Anna came back a few minutes later and said to me that there was a guy who seemed to be pacing and walking around the parking lot. There were no other cars there other than ours, and she mentioned how it seemed a little weird because he kept looking over. I came out from behind the counter and looked out the window. It was the same man who had talked to me two times earlier that day. I told Anna this, and we both figured that he knew we were closing and was waiting for me to leave. We both were very concerned, and I decided to call my dad. Luckily, we lived only a few miles away, and it wasn't too far of a drive. My dad said he would be there soon, and when he arrived, he was able to pick me up right outside the door so I didn't have to talk to the man. He drove Anna and I to our cars, which were at the other end of the parking lot, but we didn't have to deal with the guy who was being extremely creepy. When we all left, we saw the guy just standing in the middle of the parking lot watching us. I didn't work at Duncan much longer after that, and never worked another closing shift or saw the man again, luckily. But I do wonder what would have happened if I had walked to my car by myself that night. About five years ago, I finally went to Dunkin' Donuts for my first time ever. I'd been meaning to go there for years, and always known it was popular, but I never got around to it until then. I went to one on the other side of town and walked inside. It was the morning, and I could see that it was really busy because there was a lot of people in line. I got to the back of the line and waited. The line slowly moved forward, and I noticed that a man got in line behind me. The man was standing uncomfortably close to me. I turned around to see that it was a really tall guy with sunglasses on and a black coat. It was awkward, because when the line would move up, I would move farther away from him, and then he would keep getting closer. He always stood a really close distance from me. Finally, when it was my turn to order, I got a couple of donuts to try them and see how they were. After I ordered it, it was the weird guy's turn, but I noticed that he didn't go up to the counter and order, he just stood there, and then when I left, he followed me out the door. With the sunglasses on, I couldn't really get a good look at the guy, and I didn't know what his deal was, but I walked back to my car in the parking lot and got inside. Thankfully, the guy didn't follow me, and I watched him walk to a car a few spaces away. I got out the donuts and was eating them in my car. I noticed that the guy got in the driver's seat of his car, which just looked like a regular silver car, and then he started watching me with the sunglasses still on. This was starting to become really weird, so I decided it was best to leave put the second donut away, and just as I was about to back out of the parking space that I was in, I saw the silver car that the guy was in start to move. I was hoping he would leave, so I waited there, but instead, he backed out of his space and kept moving backwards until his car was completely blocking mine from leaving. Then, I watched the man exit his car and walk over to the back of mine. It looked like he took a photo of my license plate, and then touched the back of my car. Then he got back inside of his car and drove away. After this, I drove home, hoping that the guy wasn't secretly following me or anything like that. I don't think he was, and I got home just fine. I was wondering the whole time exactly what he was doing back there, and why he would take a picture of my license plate. Then, I went to go inside, and as I passed by the back side of my car, I noticed that where the man had touched my car, there appeared to be some sort of bumper sticker. I looked at it, and saw that it didn't have any writing on it. I picked it off my car because I didn't want it on there and went to throw it away. Then I saw that on the other side, it said, I'm watching you. It looked like it had been written in Sharpie. I threw it in the garbage and went inside. After that, I never saw the guy again, but I wonder sometimes if he was actually stalking me or if he got me confused with somebody else. I work at a Dunkin' Donuts. 
I've been working there for roughly a year. The craziest thing that's happened so far was about four months ago. I typically work opening shifts. We open at 6 a.m., so I get there long before that and help with getting things ready before we open. We make donuts and do more preparing and things like that. One morning, I was the first one to arrive. There's usually a few of us working, but when I got inside, I turned on a light in the back. I began to get a few things ready and wait for some of my coworkers to show up and help. I then heard a noise come from the back area where there were a bunch of boxes and things like that. I guessed I wasn't alone, and one of my coworkers was there after all. I called out hey, but didn't get a response. I sat there in silence for a few minutes. Then, when I finally moved again, I thought I heard another noise come from back there. That's when I decided to investigate. I walked back to the boxes, and there were a lot of them. This was in the very back area, and none of us went over here very often. I looked around, and it was mostly dark, and I didn't see anything at all. Then, I thought I heard a very small noise. I walked farther back and looked behind one of the larger boxes. That's when I saw a man crouched behind it, looking at me. This was probably the last thing that I was expecting to see, and I jumped back in shock. He didn't work there, and I had no idea who he was. I started walking back quickly when I heard him start to get up, and I started running at that point. I then heard the man let out a loud yell, almost a scream. He wasn't saying anything, but just screaming, basically. I ran to the bathroom and locked myself inside. Thankfully, it was a whole room for the bathroom, not just some stalls, so the man couldn't get inside. The man tried opening the door, but couldn't get in. I then heard him walk away. I got out my phone and started to call the police, but just then, I heard the front door open and a woman scream. This was my coworker Sydney, who was arriving to work. I opened the bathroom door up and saw the man running from in front of the counter to behind it. Then I saw Sydney standing in the entrance of the doorway. She then turned and ran back outside into the parking lot. I used this opportunity to run to the door and leave the building as well. The man was somewhere in the back again, and Sydney and I called the police and waited in our cars for them to arrive. When they did, they were able to go inside and get the man. I don't know how he got inside, but I guess he must have found his way in the previous night and hid when we closed. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. Several years ago, I used to live sort of near a dollar store. It was about 10 minutes away from my apartment and slightly closer than most of the other stores in the shopping area that was nearby. I really didn't go there much, but I occasionally would to get certain products. One night, I decided to go out and get a birthday card for my sister because it was her birthday later that week. I figured the best deal would be at the dollar store, so I drove there. The dollar store was called Dollar Tree, and I walked inside to see that they did in fact have a really good selection of birthday cards inside. The store wasn't too busy, and I was able to look through a bunch of cards before I finally found one that I liked for my sister. After I got it, I walked over and checked out with the cashier, then left the store. I walked out to my car in the quiet, dark parking lot, then got inside my SUV and started to drive away. I had my music going like I always did, which was connected to my phone through Bluetooth. But about halfway home, I thought I heard a strange noise. I turned down my music and listened. I didn't hear anything for a few seconds. But then I heard it again. It was coming from the back of my car. I looked behind me. I saw in the far back of my car behind the second row of seats, the head of a man emerged, and I was looking right at his face for a good second. I screamed and immediately pulled the car over to the side of the road. I'm not sure why I did that, but I was purely reacting to the situation. Unfortunately, I was driving down a quiet road on the way back home. And there were really no places I could go to. It was pretty much just woods and fields on both sides. Once my car was pulled over, I did have the presence of mind to take the keys out, and when I got out and off the road, I went into the woods. I took off running, and as I did, 
I heard the back of my car start to swing open. I looked, and just for another second, I saw a man running into the woods towards me. The man was wearing a black sweatshirt with the hood up and jeans. I turned away after seeing him, and it made me run faster. I had a good 40 or 50 feet on him, and I dodged tree branches and ran into a bunch of bushes and tall grass and things like that. I was running fast, and I had no idea where I was going, but I could hear the man running behind me. He didn't really seem to be getting closer, though, and eventually I heard him less and less. I slowly turned my sprint into a jog, and then I noticed something in the distance. It was a house. The house had a light on, and I ran to the front door and started pounding on it. I didn't see the man behind me, and I was hoping he wouldn't catch up. I kept knocking on the door, and after like 30 seconds, it finally opened. A woman opened the door, and I told her what had happened. She didn't want to let me in her house, though. I'm not sure if she believed my story and thought I was a creep or something. I couldn't really blame her, and she was about to close her door in my face when I asked her if she could just call the police for me. She agreed to do that and called the police. I waited near her house, constantly looking at the entrance of the woods in case the man would return. Eventually, the police arrived, and I told them the whole story. We all went back to my car, which was still on the side of the road with the back of it wide open. They didn't find the man, so I guess he ran away somewhere. Whoever that guy was must have snuck in my car when I was in the Dollar Tree. I guess it was unlocked or something. I'm not sure if he was planning to attack me or what, but I'm glad I saw him when I did. I used to work at a dollar store. I was a cashier, but we never really got too busy, so it wasn't uncommon for me to do other stuff around the place. Typically, on weeknights, there were just a few of us working, and sometimes just one. One night, I was working with just my coworker until she left at 9 o'clock because the place was already super quiet and we closed at 10. I agreed to close the place up, and it was an easy hour where I rang up a couple of customers, and then there were no customers in the place at all. I left my register to sweep the floor nearby and hoped nobody else would come in the store for the remaining 20 minutes that we were open. I was almost done sweeping when I heard the front doors to the store opening up. I looked and saw a man wearing a dark blue jacket and baseball cap walk inside. He immediately turned to the right and went behind an aisle out of my view. I finished up my sweeping of the floor and then walked back over to my register to be ready for when the man would check out. Time went by and then I announced over the store speaker that we would be closing in 10 minutes. I once again repeated that when we were closing in 5 looked around the aisles that I could see, but I didn't see the man at all. When it was 10 o'clock, I announced that we were now closed, and he had to come up to the cash register and check out. I waited a couple of minutes, but there was still nothing. I then walked over and locked the entrance door so nobody else would come inside. Then I decided to walk through the store and see where this man was. I went down the first aisle, and he wasn't there. I then went down a few more, but couldn't find him. Finally, I'd been around basically the entire store, and then realized he must have gone to the bathroom. We had our bathrooms in the back corner of the store near the employee break room, and there was a back room there as well where we had extra merchandise. I walked towards there, and as soon as I made it to the little hallway area that was back there, I saw him. It looked like he was almost hiding behind the door that led to our back room. As soon as I saw him, he darted from behind there and ran to the main area of the store. I walked out hoping to see him leave, but I didn't hear him leaving. Instead, I heard movement towards the middle of the store. Then, suddenly, I saw a man jump out from behind another aisle and throw a glass cup at me. I was able to move out of the way and dodge it just in time. I walked back around the side of the store and away from the man and made my way back to the front. I yelled that the man needed to leave now or I was calling the police. I didn't know what his problem was, but he was acting really strange. I didn't hear him leaving, though. I wasn't sure if this guy was insane or what. Then I heard a loud crash come from the area where he was. Now I knew I needed to call the police. But before I could, I heard more noises and watched the man run out of the store. After he had left, I wanted to run over to the door and lock it. But as I was on the way there, I saw him run back inside. He ran out of my sight again. I decided it was best for my safety if I just left the store. So I ran outside, then called the police. I waited inside my car, and eventually they arrived. The police came, and the police went inside the store and were able to get the man. When I went back inside, I saw all the damage that he caused. 
He made quite a mess, and I stayed late to clean it up. I was just happy everyone was okay. I think the guy was on drugs, or else he was just insane. A few years back, when I had recently graduated from high school, I was hanging out with my friend Josh at his house. We played video games until like 10 o'clock at night or so. Then I got tired and went back to my place. I lived only a few blocks away, so I had walked there from my parents' house. As I was on my way back, I passed by this little dollar store that was in town. I was pretty thirsty, so I walked around to the front and went inside to get something to drink. I hadn't actually been to this store before, but I had drove and walked past it all the time. It just looked a little cheap and run down to me. When I got inside the place, it didn't seem very nice. It was sort of cluttered and old looking. Nobody else was in there though, so I walked right over to the fridge, grabbed a drink, and then made my way to the register. It seemed strange in there, because half of the lights were off, and when I got to the register, there was nobody there. I looked around wondering where the employees were. I seemed to be the only person in the entire store at all. I looked behind the counter, and nobody was there. I set my drink near the register, and then took a few steps away. Just then, I heard a voice come from behind me. I looked back over at the counter and there was now a tall man standing there. He asked me if I was ready to check out. I jumped when I saw him. It was like he had just suddenly appeared. There wasn't a back room right behind the counter that he could have come from, and I had looked behind it before, and if he was ducking below it, I would have seen him there as well. I just said yes, and then paid for my drink. I then started to walk away. I looked back once again, but the man was now gone. Nobody was behind the counter. I was so confused and I don't know what happened. I felt kind of creeped out by the whole thing. I started just walking home and looked back one last time. I now saw the man standing outside the store about 10 feet from the door, just staring at me. It really gave me the creeps and I walked faster and went the rest of the way home. It was one of the strangest experiences of my life. I later found out that the store closed at nine every night and I had gone there way past 10 p.m. That just makes it even weirder. My daughter asked me if I wanted to share one or two personal experiences I've had as a police officer. She's a cop too and seems to think that they may go some way in humanizing us in the eyes of our detractors. I have my doubts, but it's important to her, so I agree to do it. So you may understand my way of seeing things. I'll give you a bit of background before I retired. I grew up middle class in the Midwest of America. After a few years of college, I quit and joined the army. Soon after I enlisted, Iraq invaded Kuwait and we were sent to dry them out. I didn't see much combat, thank God. After my enlistment ended, I got out and enrolled in the police training program. I graduated that and became a street cop. The majority of my career was spent on the streets until I retired a couple of years ago. These days, I earn my daily bread as a gunsmith, and that's about the lot of it. The story I'm telling today started not long after I got my first assignment. I answered a call at a supermarket. The female manager met me at the front doors and informed me that a man was bothering customers. I walked around the store until I came across a disheveled middle-aged man. He was talking to a pair of teenage girls. They were visibly distressed, so I approached and told the girls that they could leave. Without blinking, the male turned to me and continued his conversation. He wasn't aggressive or loud, but you could tell from his body language and behavior that he clearly had some sort of mental illness. I asked him some questions and he answered politely. I mentioned that some people had complained about him. His only reply was, okay. He apparently lived nearby with his sister. Unsure of what to do, I thought for a minute and suggested that he may want to return home in case she was looking for him. This tact seemed to have worked, as he said okay again and headed toward the front. I followed him alongside, continuing to make small talk. Everything was going well until he noticed the manager standing nearby and unexpectedly blew up on her. I approached him and inquired what was wrong. He pointed at her and said she was 
a bad person, a mean person, he yelled. I suggested that he'd be happier if he left the store where she couldn't bother him, and he agreed. We stood out front and talked a few more minutes until he said that he had to leave. I said goodbye and watched him walk off until he disappeared behind the gas station. I re-entered the store and spoke to the manager one final time. I explained the situation and she looked to be relieved. And with all parties satisfied, I headed back to my cruiser to finish my shift and do a bit of write-ups. I assumed the problem had been resolved and put the call out of my mind. A few weeks went by and I got another call to the market. It was a near carbon copy of the first. On this occasion, I came across Barry, I forgot to mention his name earlier in the story, as he had a young man cornered near the pharmacy. I believed he was talking about Henry kissing her when I walked up, it was really weird. The poor kid had no clue what he was talking about. As before, I interjected so the kid could escape. I took advantage of our prior meeting and again convinced Barry that he may be needed at home. He agreed and this time I figured I could just let him walk out unaccompanied. And this was a rookie mistake. A minute had it passed and I heard him yelling at somebody. I figured it was the manager and I was right. I stepped between them and Barry soon lost interest. No further talk was needed to get him to leave after that. I was beginning to wonder why he hated this woman so much when he was so friendly to complete strangers. I asked if he and her had any previous history, but she couldn't remember ever seeing him until recently. And I'll never claim to know what's going on in the head of a crazy person. Maybe he just hated her face. Who knows? Over the next several months, Barry became a regular source of problems not only for the store, but for me. At least twice a week, I would get called about him. Not always from the store, but... It was the store from where the friction occurred and made my job that much harder. I became so desperate to solve this problem I met with his sister. I'd hoped that between the two of us, we'd be able to find a solution. Unfortunately, she had a load of problems of her own. She was clearly battling some painful and degenerative disease. She was in no state to be dealing with her brother. I left their house feeling disappointed and honestly even more hopeless. Not long after that visit, something changed in Barry. His aggressive attitude toward the manager escalated drastically. On one call to the store, I was met outside by the woman in question, and she was a mess. Barry had approached her out of nowhere and started cursing and even threatening to kill her. He'd already left the store before I arrived, so I didn't get to talk to him. This incident made me even more determined to solve the problem peacefully once and for all. Something told me bad things were ahead. After several meetings with his caseworker, we came to the consensus that Barry may need to be institutionalized, at least temporarily. We were actually waiting for all the specifics to be resolved when he took his vendetta all the way to the end. If I recall right, it had been around a week since I'd had any Barry-related calls. The opportunity to experience new and varied crimes were a welcome change, I was nearing the end of my shift one night when I heard the all-too-familiar address come across the radio, but this time something was very different. There had been reports of gunshots from a few homeowners nearby, but there had also been a call from a female stating that she had been attacked outside the store and was forced to shoot the assailant. I took the call and hurried to the scene. When my backup and I arrived, I could see the manager sitting on the curb alongside a male I didn't recognize. The manager was bawling her eyes out. The man appeared to be attempting to comfort her. A piece of fabric was wrapped around the man's forearm. It looked to be lightly stained with a red substance, probably blood. What I saw next made my heart sink. Illuminated in my headlights before me lay the body of a male, and that male was Barry. We exited our cruisers and began our work. According to the manager, she and her fellow employee had stayed over after the store closed to do the usual paperwork. The gentleman was walking her to her car when Barry appeared from the bushes and began ranting at her as usual. Only this time, he was waving a knife around. The male employee tried to de-escalate the encounter only to get a slash across his arm for his trouble. And this is when the female manager drew her gun from her purse and fired on Barry six times. He had unfortunately passed before we arrived. In her statement, 
She said after he began threatening her, she bought a pistol and took a self-defense class. And I really don't blame her. Barry's behavior was becoming very menacing near the end. It was a very sad situation all around, but she'd done everything legally and there was no grounds to prosecute. She was clearly traumatized by taking a life, as you would expect. The saddest part of this all was what we would discover later. Barry had apparently stopped taking his meds around the time I first encountered him. This was the most probable reason for his downhill slide. I did get to speak to his sister on one more occasion. She indicated that he would occasionally fixate on a single person, and this person was usually a stranger in a position of power. In certain instances, he would stop taking his medication, this would be amplified. In the past, she had been able to get him to return to his pills and the trouble would stop. Sadly, this time she had been distracted with her own health battle and missed the signs, and I don't blame her either. The truth is, no one should be saddled with the care of someone like Barry. In this case, it truly does take a village. Out of all the things I saw and dealt with in my career, what occurred in those few months involving Barry have stuck with me ever since. The way in which I interacted with suspects, how I handled unknown situations, all of it grew out of how things played out in his case. His death made me a better cop, believe it or not. I realize that may sound odd, but I assure you it's true. I was determined to avoid similar results in the future. The citizens I interacted with weren't always happy with my decisions, but it kept people safe and that's all that mattered to me at the end of the day. What I've written here is the bulk of what occurred in that case. There may be a few facts I chose to leave out, but the idea is still the same. When my little girl came to me with this idea, I was not only skeptical, but more than reticent to share personal aspects of my career. This story in particular doesn't portray me in a very professional light. I don't think most cops would like people to know just how clueless we all are at the start of our career. Initially, I planned on writing about another case, but then realized this story was perfect for what my daughter had envisioned. As for if I actually achieve what I set out to do, that's up to the readers to determine. I did my best, not being a professional writer and on, I hope what I was trying to say came across clearly enough. I've definitely rattled on much longer than necessary, and although I have a lot more I'd like to include, I'll just end here. <laughs>